Hello, everyone. <laughs> I just hit something wrong there. But hello, this is criminal profiler Pat Brown. Can you see and hear me since I accidentally touched something and I cut off my intro? Gee, what a way to start the show. So, <laughs> oh my goodness. Just tell if you can say if you can hear and see me since I botched that. Hello, everyone. Somebody say you can see and hear me. Hi, Pat. You can see and hear me. Okay, good. Okay. <laughs> I just hit something and it wiped out my, my intro. So anyway, welcome everyone. Uh, if you're new to the channel, that was half of my intro. Um, and uh, if you're new to the channel, please do like and subscribe. Uh, that helps this educational channel keep going. And if you would like to be in the chat room with the wonderful people that are here today, uh, please do check out Patreon. The link is below. Five bucks a month. You can come to eight live shows and participate in a great community. And by the way, you don't always have to join Patreon to see my videos because there is not one hidden video. All my videos are public for the purposes of education. So just subscribe. Okay. Now, as you can see, this is a live show. I don't edit. And when I screw up, you get to see that too. All right. We have a huge crowd here today. So this must be a case people are really interested in. And it is a fascinating one. And it's from 1961. It is about the disappearance of Joan Risch. And it happened in Massachusetts in, on October 24th, 1961. And a lot of old cases, they're hard to discuss because there's not much information about them. And since I like to analyze I want to do something that is useful and I'm not a storyteller. So there are, there are channels that are telling the story of Joan Risch, uh, but I don't do storytelling. I do analysis. So I have to have something to work with. And this case is quite fascinating. And there are five major theories about this case, about what happened to Joan, because let me give you the real quick thing about what happened to Joan. So it says here right on Wikipedia, uh, late on the afternoon of October 24th, 1961, Police visited an address in Lincoln, Massachusetts, after a neighbor reported seeing a trail of blood leading from the house to the driveway. Uh, she made the discovery after a young girl, that's that's the daughter of Joan, who had been who had been visiting at her house, uh, playing with her son. She went, she dropped her back at the house, and the little girl went in and came back out and said she saw red paint all over the kitchen. And the red paint, of course, was blood. And her mother was not there. And her little brother was upstairs in the crib. He was too crying. So Joan was not there. Her car was still in the driveway. So that's what happened. And Joan has never been seen since. Uh, clearly something appeared to have happened here, although there's a lot of uh, viewpoints on whether this was a real crime scene or a staged crime scene and what could have put the blood in this location. Uh, but Joan was never seen again. And so what happened to her? So that's the interesting thing about this whole story. Now, I want to tell you where it got some of my information. I'm taking off my glasses because I'm having trouble seeing with them. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm taking them off. Okay. So um, I used, there are, there are, well, <laughs> how can I say this nicely? There's a bunch of stuff on the internet, a uh, bunch of uh, videos on this case. And most of them I found pretty awful. And the reason I found them awful is because they tell the story, but they get into their own personal analyses of the case when they don't have the background to do so. And I just find that misleading to people. Um, and that's where people start jumping on things and getting conspiracy theories and all kinds of weird stuff because they're not getting an accurate understanding of the evidence and of what a theory should be, as opposed to somebody who is telling a story and then going, oh my God, I think it could be this. I think this is what happened. So if you're going to watch something on YouTube, this is the best one I found, The Disappearance of Joan Risch. It's by a, a group a uh, person, a woman, I have a woman who does this one, it's called Dark Curiosities. Um, and she's got a lovely voice, in my opinion. And she tells it very straightforward. So if you want to just hear the basic story in 22 minutes, this is the one to, to listen to. If you want to stop this, if you're not here live, and you want to stop and just run over there for 22 minutes and come back, that's fine. Uh, I will give you the information on the case. But if you just want a, a solid straight through, this is it. Now, 
There's only one book on this case. And this is A Kitchen Painted in Blood, The Unsolved Disappearance of uh, Joan Risch. And um, let me give you the guy's name who wrote it because it seems to be blocked out here. Um, I think it's a very good book. And I like to promote people when I think they do something that um, is worthwhile, shall we say. Uh, let's see if this is, yeah, there we go. Uh, his name is Stephen Ahern, okay? And he's not a profiler or a detective, uh, but he does a tremendous amount of research in this book and he brings in a lot of history and geography, which is interesting. I mean, I, I sort of flew through it because I have to look at just the evidence issues, not so much of background stuff, but very well written. And I think you really will enjoy it. Um, he's got a lot of pictures in, in, in the book and I have to admit I'm using some of them on the show today. So, and I think I may have stolen a couple out of here too. So I want to recommend both of these because they both were useful to my um, understanding of this case. Um, the only thing I'm going to say here, I'm going to present it is he has a theory himself, um, which I find not very, <laughs> not very rational in my opinion. Um, and this is where, what happens when you get a person who's got, does a tremendous amount of research, but then not as a profiler or a detective comes up with what he thinks is a, a viable theory. And I'm like, not so much, but I'm going to read you his entire theory. And I'm not, you know, I think, I think the book's great. And I think he gave it a good try, but this is, and he didn't say the guy absolutely did it. He says, this is the one he thinks, he thinks is the best theory. And I'm probably going to tear it apart, but I just want to say, okay, you know, he has a right to do that. And he didn't say the guy did it. So, but this is why I'm always a little leery about people who go from being good storytellers and researchers to be being profilers. Okay. And, and people necessarily believing that they have the ability to do so. So that's why I prefer straight storytelling. If that's what you do well, uh, I don't do that. So I want that to be somebody else's thing. All right. So now I do need my glasses back. What the heck is going on? I'm like halfway between being able to read and not read today. I'm falling apart. My eyes are anyway. Um, so anyway, all right. I'm just checking in the room to see if there's anybody saying something I'm going to talk about. Okay, let me let me go to what happened in this case. And before I go, yeah, before I go into the exact details of the case, I do want to tell you her background, okay? Because I think people have brought a lot of her background into the theories, that, they're, that they have about this case. And so I think it's important. I'm going to go to another site, not Wikipedia. Uh, and this guy says, uh, this is coming from Reddit. Um, it's called The Bizarre Disappearance of Joan Risch, uh, posted by U Northeastern. And he says more information about the case can be found on a student run series. And I don't know exactly where he got his stuff from or she, but I think it's, it's just easy to listen to. So I'm gonna use it. All right. The early beginnings of her life were a tragedy. Born in 1930, Joan Risch, uh, born Car Joan, Joan Carolyn Bard, was originally from Brooklyn, New York, before moving to New Jersey when she was nine years old. One day when she was out visiting relatives, her parents were killed and it was later described as a suspicious house fire. All right, let me stop with the house fire thing. Um, so her parents were killed. Some people say, well, did she, did, what, did she set the fire? No, she wasn't home. <laughs> she was with some other people. <laughs> so she wasn't there. They lived in, I think it was three floors. I think it was an apartment. Um, the father was found dead, like, like sitting in a chair with a fo the phone in his hand, like trying to call for help, even though he turned off the phone <laughs> like a couple of weeks back. So I don't know how he's going to use it. And the mother was sitting there dead too. Um, I can't remember. He was on the floor. She's in a chair, whatever it was, but they were dead in the room. And the big suspicion about the fire that people go crazy about is that their dog was found wrapped in a blanket in the basement. And so you go, they go, oh, my God, the dog would have barked. And if, they, you know, if, they, if somebody was setting the fire, why didn't the dog bark? So people are then theorizing that the dog was murdered first, you see, and put in the basement. <laughs> and then they murdered the parents. This is nonsense. When the fire, it was a big fire and it happened very quickly. It, every, things collapsed and the dog was probably next to the bed and collapsed into the basement, probably overcome by smoke like the, the, the parents that had hardly moved from their position. They weren't even burnt. They just, the smoke just took them over really quick. And that was that. So no, this is the, the police never thought it was really a suspicious fire. So the loss of her parents had nothing to do with homicide. It was a horrifying fire, which 
sucks for a nine-year-old to go away from home and then hear your parents died in a fire and your dog. So not nice. And this could, of course, have an effect on her looking at life and how she would proceed. Next thing that happened was she was taken in by an aunt and uncle. And um, they raised her. Probably did a pretty good job. They had, I think there were, I'm going to guess here because I can't remember. I think there were three sons that were younger than her. Um, she seemed to get along with everybody. Um, she did well enough. She didn't seem to love the situation as much. She had seemed to like her mother more than her father as she was being raised. Um, then she went off to college. So she didn't do poorly there. She didn't get into drugs and gangs and <laughs> she didn't get pregnant and anything bad. Just she had some issue with her, her uh, adoptive father. Now the claim is, so this is important too for people's viewpoints on this. Um, according to those close to her, Joan was sexually assaulted by her uncle while there. Supposedly she made some statements to her husband and to the mother eventually, and to some friends that her, her adoptive father had been a little frisky with her. I know he was frisky with quotes. Um, she never described what he actually did. She never said uh, he raped her. And I'm not trying to downplay any other kind of sexual assault, but it's hard to know what that means. So did it mean that he, may, he might be too friendly and give her kisses on the lips. Was it that he brushed against her boob? Was it that that he got drunk and pressed against her? You know, what, what did it actually mean? That's what we don't know. So, but the uh, author of the book seems to think this is extraordinarily important, which is why I bring it up now. So anyway, she had uh, some issues with him and she went off you know, to college and she was happy sort of not to be there. Uh, she did go back for, I think, one year, but she was happy you know, to, to move on. Uh, it says here, despite her traumatized childhood, Joan persevered and went on to graduate school, graduating with a degree in English in 1952, which was, she was a very accomplished woman uh, getting a graduate degree. She later started working as a secretary, then became an editorial assistant at a publishing company in New York City. So she was a successful woman. A uh, very smart woman and very successful. And also remember that she got her uh, degree in literature because that also plays into, an, into another theory. Um, uh, in 1954, Joan met her future husband. Uh, his name is Martin Risch at a Harvard football game and they instantly hit it off. In 1956, two years later, the couple got married and Joan promptly left her career to settle down in Ridgefield, Connecticut and started a family with Martin having two children, Lillian and David. A couple of years later, around April 20, 60, 1961, they moved to Lincoln, Massachusetts. Joan focused on raising her children as she also dabbled in writing and reading as hobbies. She was also engaged in the Women's League of Women Voters, Women's League of Voters. So she appeared to have a very successful life. She was also thinking maybe when she, kids got older, she would go into teaching. Uh, everybody described her as being happy. They described the marriage as being good. There were no suspicions of any of any weird behavior from her. She seemed to have a very solid life, very involved in the community, loved raising her kids. And again, this plays into one of the theories. Was she unhappy with her, with being a homemaker? Was she unhappy with her life and therefore wanted to escape from it by staging this crime scene and running away? So I'll be getting into that. All right. So everything seemed to be pretty good until that day. Okay. So what happened that day? All right. So I'm just going to check out some comments here. Um, uh, oh, well, this is true. No one knows what goes on behind closed doors. Could it have been marriage problems? Well, no one ever absolutely knows. That's true. Uh, however, he was out of town uh, when she was, when she was, well, when she disappeared, um, he was out of town. And so the only way he would be involved if he hired a hitman, um, which is no evidence of, by the way, uh, or the simple fact is one could say he traveled too much and therefore she felt alone too often and had too much, you know, just being stuck at the house and not being able to be in the professional life. These things are true, but also you have to be, be aware of overdoing things like that. You know, because people always want to find something 
really um, suspicious behind everything that if you were a, if you were a professional woman, you couldn't enjoy being home with your kids for a few years. You know, I, you know, I, I would, well, before my kids were born, I can't say I was a professional woman, but I stayed home with my children for 14 years. I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it. And I homeschooled my kids. And then I got into medical sign language interpreting. And then I got into criminal profiling. It, you know, there are different points in life when you can do different things. And just because you take a few years off to raise children, especially you were talking 1960s, a lot of women stayed home. So you weren't even alone um, because, you know, there were, there were neighbors. She had neighbors, women friends who were home. And that was a great thing. As a homeschooler, I had homeschooling friends who were home. Thank God. And that was in the 1980s. Um, so we could get together with each other, go to the park together. So we weren't lonely. But there are some times, and this, this day and age is more like that, where women who were professionals stay home, they've got nobody around them. They, all their friends are working and they're miserable unless they join a mother's group. So, yes, you can be unhappy in your, your homemaking life. But there's no indication that she was. And so we shouldn't jump to a conclusion just because she once was a professional, she hated life so much she wanted to disappear. But I'll get into that with the different theories. OK. All right. So. All right. Now. Um, let's go on here. Um, so now what happened that day? All right. So this is a very unique case in the time frame and the, uh, and what happened at the house. All right. So this is the house. I, I show this because one of the interesting things about it, it is set back. Let me see if I can find the, uh, this was Ahern um, presented this. Um, she lived at the, oh, uh, this is better here. She lived at two, by the way. Uh, so this is a street, which you see can come off this street and her house would be the first on the left. Easy exit if you were kidnapping somebody. But she was here and her neighbors where the kids were playing was over here. All right. But there were lots of trees. And I think the tree thing is, is kind of important. So let's look at the house. As you can see, this, this is her car that's parked in front of the house in the driveway. Uh, this is the back of the house, has no exit from the back of the house. And this is, again, the driveway. So you can see a lot of trees around here. I think I have another picture of that here. Many trees. And the neighbor across the way where she left her, her, her daughter to play and when she went missing um uh was able to see some of the house some of the driveway out her window but it was a bit of a distance so she saw she thought she saw her out there at a certain point in time so but but you wonder why didn't anybody else see anything that was going on yeah so so there there's a couple sightings of a car uh coming out that that uh parked in her driveway and coming out that was not her car and also some sightings of her, her walking around town um, in three different areas. And I'll get to that. So, but no other neighbors saw too much. And so, because I think the trees were there and that's important because first of all, it, it blocks the view and it helps if it, it is a predator of any sort, or even if it wasn't a predator, somebody she knew who pulled into the driveway behind her car. Remember here's her car. Some car was seen behind her car. Um, they might think nobody's actually going to see them because the car, the house is off the street and is surrounded by a, a lot of trees. So it's not like uh, everybody in town would be looking right out, you know, right at your house, seeing somebody coming and going and all that stuff. So they might feel a bit of seclusion and, um, and that could be a choice. Okay. So, and also I want you to note where, what it looks like around there for the issue of whether uh, Joan actually staged a crime scene and ran away without her car or whether she had some kind of incident there, which caused her to be, to bleed a lot all over the kitchen, which some people think it was a miscarriage. Some people think it was a, a bad abortion and then somehow left the property. And so we'll get into all those theories, but I just want you to have a sort of feeling for the, um, the house. All right. And so here's what happened as far as the story goes. Um, uh, her husband, her husband, uh, got up on that morning. He left a six for 50 for a, a flight to New York city for a two day business trip. And he drove to the airport. So they had two cars. Uh, this was her car. He had one. So he was 
out of town. That's proven. Uh, Joan was left alone at the home with four-year-old Lillian and two-year-old David, and they did their normal daily activities. Again, very important when you're looking at why anything would happen. You have to look at the daily activities. Is something off or something normal? Uh, Joan woke up, uh, Lillian and David gave them breakfast. She took David to a neighbor, Barbara Baker. That's the one across the street. Uh, so she could take Lillian for a dentist appointment. Now, there's some people who think that the dentist appointment was really an abortion. <laughs> However, the dentist actually worked on Lillian's teeth and also worked on Joan's teeth. It's not an abortionist, okay? So this is where you just jump into conclusions. Not, not happening. All right. So she did go to a dentist appointment. That's a documented fact. All right. So, and then after that, she cashed a check and went shopping with Lillian. Again, if you hadn't just had an abortion, you probably aren't running around town shopping. Um, soon after, while the Rishas were absent, the milkman and the mailman arrived at, and delivered stuff to the house. They didn't notice anything unusual. A dry cleaner also came to pick up Martin's suits. He also, he also said nothing seemed out of the ordinary. She was there at that, uh, I think she was there at that time and actually gave the suits to him and he drove away. At 11 a.m., Joan and Lillian returned home for lunch. And around noon, Joan went to retrieve her son. Oh, I forgot to tell you. Uh, yeah, she had given her son to Barbara across the street uh, to watch while she went to the dentist appointment. And now she retrieved, uh, she went home, uh, had lunch with uh, Lillian. Then she went and got her son from the neighbor's house and put him down for his early afternoon nap. He slept apparently from around 12 to 2. While he napped, Barbara Baker brought her son, D Douglas, over to play with Lillian in front of the Rish house. So across the street is Barbara. She brings her son over and the two kids play. Apparently, they share, you know, playtime together. So Barbara would bring over her son and little, uh, Joan, Joan would bring over her, her kids, uh, just especially uh, the older girl, the Lillian girl, uh, so that each one of them could get a break. This is what mothers used to do. Um, after working in her garden at 1.55 p.m., Joan brought the two children back to the Barker house at the swing set. That was Lillian, was Barbara's uh, son, and her daughter Lillian. Joan had told them that she would be back shortly. However, she didn't say anything to the Barkers themselves when she returned home alone. Now, may people make a big deal of this uh, because why didn't she, when she brought the kids back over, why didn't she say to the mother, hey, the kids are here, pay attention? And I don't know. I don't know what their general practices were. Maybe because they were just across the street from each other. As long as somebody brought the kids back and forth, they weren't worried. The kids were playing here. They were playing there. Um, and so why she didn't say anything, I don't know. I would think if she wanted to be, this is important, if she wanted to be absolutely sure that that child did not show up back at her house in a short period of time. In other words, something nefarious is going on over here. I would think you would want the neighbor to keep that kid away as long as possible to say something like, oh, I have a really important phone call I have to make. Can you keep her here for an hour or two? You wouldn't just drop her off because she might just show back up in 10 minutes. So clearly Joan was not concerned about the return of her daughter being something interfering with whatever was going on. And some people think she's having an affair. She's some guy pulled into the driveway of this car and they were having sex up there. That's why she didn't want her daughter around. But, you know, if you really don't want your daughter around, you better make sure she doesn't return with a neighbor lady, you know. So makes a little sense that she was trying to hide anything. She just dropped them off to play because she probably wanted to go back to her house and read a book, take a break. Her kid was sleeping, do some cleaning, whatever she wanted to do. And she just, OK, we'll drop you off here at the plate. They had a little play set. They're going to play on the swings, you know. Um, so she did that. And um so then it says, um, about 2.15 p.m., Barbara was in her kitchen and happened to glance out the window. There she saw, saw Joan, now think of, remember 2.15, uh, wearing a trench coat and standing next to a blue sedan. This is, what is it, October? It's chilly-ish, okay? And standing next to a blue sedan in the driveway. She appeared to be carrying something red and walking hastily in somewhat of a daze. Now, this whole story is uh, is really questionable. Um, some people think she's walking away from the house, but as far as I can see, she was walking toward the house. So did she run back out to the car to grab something and then run back toward the house? Is this a big deal? Um, it was also seen through the trees, and so she and she's doing stuff, and she glances out, and she sees something. 
she did she stopped for a second to look but does this have any great meaning except that she was alive at 215 also how do we know it was 215 i'm always amazed at these absolute time frames because i when i was home with my kids i had never had a clue what time it was <laughs> you know the kids could say ma i'm really hungry i'm like well it's not even lunch oh yeah it is lunchtime didn't realize it time flew you know we were busy I didn't, wasn't looking at my watch every three seconds to find out what time it was. So how she knew it was 2.15 and not 2 o'clock, I don't know. Um, so I really don't know about this sighting, how important it is um, at all. Except that maybe she ran out to the car because she had bought stuff. Maybe she ran out to the car. And now there's claims that what she saw was that her little son was up from the nap and was wearing red and running down the driveway. And she was running after the child to stop him from running into the street. Except when he was found, he wasn't wearing red and he was still in the crib. So he was still in his night clothes. So that makes no sense whatsoever. I think we can just chuck that out, even though some people will try to make a lot of it. I don't think she was chasing her son down the driveway. I don't think she was chasing anybody down the driveway. I don't think she was being chased down the driveway. I think she just went out to the car and got something and ran back in the house. I just don't see any enough evidence here to say that has great meaning. All right. So after that happened, um, then Barbara didn't think much of it at the time. Well, see, that's the thing. She didn't think much of it. So if it had been really important, you would think she would have gone, what's wrong with her? Um, uh, she just merely assumed Joan was playing around with the kids. But Barbara was not aware of the children being back outside her home. Now I hear two stories about that. One is that the children were actually in the kitchen with her when she looked out the window. So now these are just a couple of different stories. Uh, and little did Barbara know to be the last verified time anybody saw Rish. An hour later, around 3.20, Virginia Keene, the daughter of the Rich Rish's next door neighbor, returned from school and recalled seeing an unfamiliar dirty blue or gray sedan. Now this is important. So the neighbor's on the same side of the street. The, the girl came back from school and saw another car parked in the driveway, okay? Um, Five minutes later, another resident said that they had stopped while driving up to Old Bedford, that's the road, uh, to allow a car to back out either of the Keens or Rish's driveway. But both Virginia and her mother said there was no car in their driveway at that time. So the Keens' daughter saw a car, and somebody five minutes later saw the car pulling out of the driveway. All right, that's important because the car is very interesting and plays into many, many parts of theories. Um, at 340, Barbara took Lillian back to her home. So, you know, there was a street, even if it wasn't heavily traveled at certain times. The kids weren't, I guess, allowed to run across the street by themselves. So the mothers took the children. So now Barbara's taking uh, her daughter, uh, Joan's daughter, Lillian, back to the house. All right. And then when she got there, believing Joan was still at home, she left Lillian to run in the house. She didn't talk to Barbara either. See how this works? Barbara didn't talk. I mean, Joan didn't talk to Barbara when she left Lillian. When Barbara returned Lillian, she just, Lillian just ran in the house. Apparently, uh, um, Joan left the doors unlocked. So then Lillian just goes into the house. And you see the kid go in the house. You're like, whatever. And you don't worry. So then she leaves her and her own children to go out shopping. She returns at 4.15 to find Lillian running back to her house. Lillian is sobbing hysterically as she struggles to tell Barbara that mommy is gone and the kitchen is covered with red paint. So Barbara rushes over to the house. She finds David crying in his crib, wet. He's still wet. His diapers are wet. And this is important too. And seeing the kitchen is not covered in paint, but is in blood. And uh, Barbara calls the police and they come. All right. So there you have that. So I'm going to get to the crime scene now. Um, I'm just going to check in on any comments. Um, let's see. Um, Um, she, she did, she did, she did drop the kids off without the mom realizing, but I think this was a regular thing with them. I just, and she, and her daughter was with her son. I think they had the knowledge. I think, I don't know how this whole the son was. I forgot. Um, that again, we're talking about times before people worried about their kids getting kidnapped all the time. And she dropped them off in the yard at the play set. So her daughter is with her son. She's not, they must have done this a lot. So they're not worried. They're playing together. And what's going to happen is they, they're, they're not going to just 
run away. And her daughter has probably been told never to run across the street. They were always told stay together. They probably either go in the house or stay out playing, and at which point the mother will realize they're there. Um, I don't know that we want to make a massive issue of it because I don't think it's, it's necessary because you know, we may disagree. We say, oh, she should have done this. Uh, or maybe when, when Barbara dropped her off, she should have made sure that Lillian hadn't run down the street. I mean, I'm sorry. Um, sorry. Uh, when she was dropping Lillian off, the mom didn't check to see if Joan was in the house. Joan could have been, I say, talk a walk around the block for all she knew. So theoretically, you could blame both moms for not being as cautious, but that doesn't matter. You just get, take the parenting thing out of it. They were good parents, took care of their kids, and then something bad happened. All right. So now let's take a look at the crime scene. Um, I'll show you some photos from that. I am going to show some. There's no body in the crime scene, so I think this is going to be okay for YouTube, I hope. <laughs> All right, so let's look here. I just, I just want to show you the house layout first. Um, so this is where you, uh, the front door is here, okay? And then the, the kitchen is actually back here. There is an entrance to the kitchen here, and usually she kept that unlocked, okay? Uh, this is a hallway. That go, this is the hallway, and this goes upstairs. And all the action pretty much took place. The, the blood stuff is heavy here. That's where the phone was. And then... There's some blood going up the stairs. I don't know if this is the way they go up the stairs. There's a couple of blood drops on the stairs and a couple of blood drops in uh, a couple of the rooms upstairs, which is kind of weird. All right. Um, so we have some pictures here. Um, this is the kitchen. I'm just going to show you behind me, and then I'm going to show you some uh, bigger pictures. So, and this is okay. Let me get to the let me get to the phone first. Okay. There's the phone. See the phone? All right. Let me show you some better pictures of the phone. So this is the picture of that. Uh, if you're in the kitchen, the phone is the black thing on the wall. It took me a while to find that, that phone actually from other pictures. Um, the hallway is what you see. You see where that thing has fallen over? The table is knocked over in the hallway. Uh, let me show you another angle of the hallway. Um, hold on a second. Hmm. Is this it? Wait a minute. Okay, that's not it. Hold on a second. I gotta find it. Uh, okay, this is this is looking from this is looking from the hallway into the kitchen. I just want to show you that. Okay, so let's go back here. All right. So there's the phone. Oops, sorry. Uh, there's the phone on the wall. You will see there's no receiver on it. Okay, let me give you a close up. There it is. What's missing is the receiver. Uh, it was ripped off. Now, a lot of things are. It's, a lot of times this is misstated that the phone was ripped off the wall. The phone was not ripped off the wall. The receiver was ripped away from the phone. It was found here on a bucket of trash in front of the refrigerator. Let me see if I can show you another picture of that. See, there's, okay, that's so, the to the right is where the phone was. And the, if the hallway is to the right of that. That's a sink. And then there's a stove. And then the hallway going in where you see the knocked over table and the phone on the wall. But the receiver is there, which is kind of odd. Uh, in the background, you'll notice that area is quite neat. The table over there, the kitchen table. And that is where uh, there's a book there. She was reading uh, The Queen of Scots. So the book was set there where she had been reading at some point in time. Uh, let's take another look at this. Um, this is a bucket of trash. Normally, it was underneath the sink. And in it, it had some uh, food items. It had a, a, a bottle, uh, empty bottle of uh, alcohol and some beer beer bottles, and that was what was in it. And you have this phone kind of hanging from that, which is one of the extremely mysterious things about the case. And I've heard some really stupid stuff uh, about how the, how the, um, that the guy there or she, why, why, why did they put the trash can in the middle of the floor? Well, I'm going to say no killer is going to go under the sink and take out the trash can. That makes no sense. And even if Joan was J Joan was in there trying to stage some crime scene, why would she put a, a pail of trash in the middle of the room? My guess is that she had moved the pail of trash out from under the sink because she was intending to take it out to the trash can. Sometimes things are just there because of something that occurred prior to person was in the process thereof, maybe pulling it out, maybe getting, you know, gets a couple, maybe there was something on the counter. She wanted to put in a can that was on the counter. She was cleaning up, but she got interrupted for some reason. 
and therefore did not continue. And that's why the trash can is sitting where the trash can is sitting. Well, I can see it's right in front of where the sink is. No, nobody's going to take that out as a staged crime scene or for any other reason. I think she just took it out because she was going to empty it. So I think that a lot is too, made, too much made of that. Now, the person didn't pull the phone off the wall um, herself or somebody attacking her didn't do that. Uh, they just, it was the, it was the receiver with the, with the court. Um, that could be, that can, two ways that could happen. I don't know quite how long the, the accord was. Um, I would think if you were making a phone call and you passed out, you might hit the floor and pull that out of the phone. So we have to keep that in mind or someone attacked her and pulled the phone out of her hand because they didn't want her making a phone call. Now, another question is, why is the phone sitting over here? And that's kind of odd. I don't really have a good answer for that, except that I don't think it was staged. I don't, if you're going to stage a crime, you would throw the phone on the floor. You wouldn't hang it on the trash. My guess is, for whatever reason, the phone was in somebody's hand when they were near that, and they just dropped it. And just because it ended up in this position didn't mean it wasn't dropped on top and slid into that position because the top of the phone catches the the edge of the uh, the um, that container there, the, the pail. So I think they could have just dropped the phone and just slid that way. So again, that's not overdue what happened. And also to try to determine whether that has anything to do with the, the actual events. Um, however, the phone is important. Why was it ripped out? That's very important. So let's keep that in mind. The important thing is not the pail. It's the phone itself being pulled because that's not, that's unusual. Let's go with unusual. Okay. So what else we do see here is there was supposedly about half a pint of blood, which the, 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 they said wasn't enough to kill her. It wasn't like a, she wasn't like shot and bleeding all over the place or stabbed. Um, they don't know what, what happened to her. Now there's different theories about where the blood came from. Let me just show you some different pictures of uh, there that most is in, there's a bunch in the corner here. Um, some, you can see that across the floor and there's um, some in the middle of the floor. Um, I don't have, where's my picture of that? Um, there's one more area, which there's, you can see that there. And some people say it looks like the, somebody tried to clean up the blood. Again, does that make sense? Let's let's look at that. Um, why would somebody try to clean up the blood? What would be the purpose of doing that? What would be the purpose of, if you're staging a scene to make it look like you got attacked and you're running away, why would you clean up the blood then? You wouldn't, you'd, you'd want it to look bloody. Secondly, why would, why would a killer waste his time trying to clean up the kitchen? Now, now there's some theories on that again, which are a little bit odd. So. At any rate, that's the basic scene. Um, some There's some children's clothes that have blood on them. And how did the blood get on them? Was that used for cleaning up? Was it used to stench uh, flow of blood? Is that how I say that? <laughs> staunch. I always have trouble with it. Stench. What did I say stench? Staunch, right? <laughs> I don't like that word. Okay. <laughs> I'm gonna. I, I had this problem in another show. I said there. I said that. I tried to say that same word, block. <laughs> and for some reason I don't like that word, and I keep screwing it up. So, oh, if, if only this wasn't a live show. All right. Um, <laughs> Queen of Queen of Scots had a bloody ending as well. Well, and I'm going to get to the book thing uh, as far as the theories. Okay, so I, I'm going to stop there with that part. That's basically the scene. There's some blood drops going up the stairs. There's some on the bottom, some on the top, just a couple. And then supposed to be something in the master bedroom and something in the in the baby's room, um, but very little. But yet, what's it doing up there? Why isn't it just all in the kitchen? There's some blood coming out of her house, um, just a little bit coming out of the drive and going to her car. There's um, a couple, there are three sets of blood smears on her car. Um, let's see. Uh, let's see. I'll read this to you now. The blood spatters, well, this is everywhere, it's not exactly true. There were some on the stairs, some in the master bedroom, but very little and in the children's room and in the driveway leading to Joan's car, but very little. We're not talking about ton, you know, blood pouring up the stairs or 
anybody you know bleeding out on the stairs. We're talking about a drop here and a drop there, and very tiny, or, or a little touch of something. Um, I don't have pictures of that, so I can't prove it. More blood was found on the right rear fender, the left side of the hood, and the center of the trunk. So that's kind of weird. It's like her car is facing in. So you got um, on the left side of the hood. So you got a little bit here. You got right rear fender here and something on the trunk, the boot of the car here. Why? Dum, dum, dum. That is also weird. Okay. There was a bloody handprint and fingerprints on the walls. Uh, the police examined a left thumbprint next to the telephone mount and processed over 50,000 sets of fingerprints. There were some fingerprints not belonging to people in the family or any known person. They did have stranger prints and they can't figure out who they are. Estimated Joan lost half a pint of blood, not enough to be life-threatening. Uh, almost all of the blood had dried except for a few spots on the floor. Uh, investigators found it odd that all the blood on the floor, there was all, a lot of blood on the floor, but no bloody footprints. It appeared that someone had tried to clean up the blood with paper towels and rags. There were no paper towels. There was art paper. There was a roll of art paper. People are mistaking for paper towels and rags, including Joan's son's overalls. We don't know that they were trying to clean up anything. So we'll get to that. The police determined that the amount of blood found probably came from a superficial wound. Rich may not have been stabbed or shot, although hemorrhaging or a blow could not be ruled out. Despite being all signs of a struggle. Now, some people say there were no signs of a struggle. And I'm like, I'm going to say the signs of a struggle <laughs> or a fake struggle. If you want to go with that, she staged this whole thing to run away. But however, there was no weapon located on the site. And that's, yeah, so somebody didn't bring a weapon and drop it. Neither did they use a weapon from the, the, like a knife from the drawer or something and attack her. So there was no weapon found. Uh, let's see. They search. Okay, so now going on here to let you know, they did bring in police dogs. The police dogs only went out to Joan's car and across the street to Barbara's house and back. That's it. The dogs never went down the, the road any place. And this is important when you talk about sightings of Joan and how she left the house. Those dogs did not find anything except went to her car, that right location of her car, and also down the driveway, across the street, and back, which is where she was that day. So the dogs seem to know what they're doing. All right. That basically is it. Now, let me add one more thing, and then we'll go into the th theories. All right. About 2.45, somebody reported a woman who looked like Joan walking on Route 2A about 200 years away from her home. <laughs> Are we talking 200 yards? <laughs> somebody typed that wrong, wrongly. About 200 yards away from her home in Lincoln. She was, quote, shuffling along and hunched over as though she were cold, wearing a long, loose-fitting gray coat that came to her knees and a handkerchief strangely tied under her chin. These two things are important. There was a gray coat missing from the house. Not the trench coat she was wearing earlier, but a gray coat. Husband identified it as being missing, which is interesting. And there was, by the way, a coat hanger sitting on top of her car. That's another very fascinating point of this case. Like, why the heck is there a coat hanger on her car? Right? And no coat on it. But where's the coat out of the closet? It's missing. And it's a gray coat. So they see this woman shuffling along, but she's got a handkerchief like tied over her head. Now, Joan wasn't a big wearer of, of any kind of headgear. Um, so that would not be something she would normally wear. We also have to ask the question, if if she were in, in a dire stress from something going wrong and she was running down the road, I don't think she stopped to put something over her head um, before she left the house. She might grab a coat because she'd be freezing. Um, but it seems a little odd that she would put that. Now, some people say, well, she was trying to sneak away. So she did that. By the way, her, her purse was in the house. Everything was in the house. Money, purse, everything. Just that gray coat was gone. So now, who was that woman? Well, also it's 245. It's pretty early on. But like she would, it seems very early on in this whole story. Let's let's see what was the last time she was seen. I'm going to go back and look at that. Uh, so, oh, 215, that's when Barbara claimed she looked out and saw um, uh, Joan in the driveway, 215. 
And at 320 is when somebody saw that car backing out of her driveway. So now let's go to the sightings. 245, so that would be before the car came out of the driveway. Uh, only 30 minutes after Barbara thinks she saw her running around the driveway. So how could this be the same woman? Unless she immediately staggered out of the house and somehow walked the 200 yards and that was her. And the car has nothing to do with it. So the car would have no, no meaning then, right? But the dog didn't go down the road. If she walked away from her house, you know, put on her coat, put on the thing and walked away the, and never took her car, the dogs would have gone down and found something on Route 2A. But the dogs didn't go there. So I don't believe that one. Uh, 315, a woman of Jones likeness was seen looking disoriented, walking along 128 in Waltham. She appeared to be cradling something against her abdomen, and it seemed there was blood running down both legs. Now, I wonder about this, now, the blood running down both legs. This is the theory people are using to think she either had a miscarriage or an abortion, and that somehow she either left the house walking if she had a miscarriage, or if somebody came over to give her an abortion, they dumped her out of the car someplace, or she jumped out of the car to escape them and um, was walking around with blood running down her legs. I'm going to go to that in a minute. I don't believe that for a minute. Either this was a homeless person <laughs> who was drunk, maybe, um, whether there was really blood or whether it was just dirt or whatever, or whether the person, uh, who knows. Then 425, a woman sh who shared a resemblance to Joan was spotted along R Route 128 near uh, Trapello Road. Again, she was noticed to have presumably blood, oh, or mud on her legs. Some of them, this, some of the sightings weren't, right away. Um, and the question is how much the people were looking for her and then thinking they saw her. Um, I don't know. Was there homeless shelters nearby? Did, how often did you see people like this on the road? Um, would be a question. Is this the same woman or are these different people? Uh, people are zooming by in a car. How accurately are they seeing anything? But And somebody said a gray coat or a blue coat. See, when you start getting that kind of thing, then you're like, well, that doesn't mean it's her then. Could have been blue coat. It's not a gray coat. So, but the gray coat was missing. So these were sightings of Joan in theory or three, three people or some other people that had nothing to do with Joan. So that, that's, that's the whole of the case at the moment. So now we're going to get into the theories. All right. So this is where it gets interesting. And this is the most important thing about this whole show is what theories do you pay attention to as a profiler? The whole point of theories when you analyze evidence is to help the police choose the best avenue of investigation, not to say so-and-so did it, or this is the only theory, or I am right. It's to say, I give more credence to this theory. Uh, this is a better one than this one. Okay. So put more effort here. Not saying you shouldn't put any effort elsewhere, but put more effort here because this seems more likely. So there are five theories about this. Let me just check your comments as I go to the theories. All right. Um, let's see. Um, let's see. Um, hold on a second. <laughs> let's see. I can't read with these glasses anymore, I tell you. Okay. Uh, Leslie says, if she was delirious and bleeding, she could have cleaned sort of on autopilot. Okay. You, you know, it's funny because, you know, I think a lot of people have had heavy periods. They've had miscarriages um, and things like that. I haven't heard of all these people being delirious and they can't, they can't think properly. And this is where I start thinking that, first of all, let's go to the miscarriage theory first, based on that. All right. So the concept is she's home and she's in the house and she miscarries. No, she has never been proven to be pregnant, by the, by the way. Okay not proven to be pregnant, not known to be pregnant, never gone to a doctor for pregnancy. So she had a miscarriage very early on. Okay. Um, I know lots of people who have miscarriages at home. Some people just think, oh, I'm having a heavy period. They don't even realize they're having a miscarriage. So anyway, let's say you're home and you just, you're hanging out and you start bleeding. You go, oh my God, what is this? I'm bleeding. Oh my God, I'm getting cramping in my stomach. Where do you go? Do you go and 
I don't know. Um, some people say, well, she, she went over here and there's, there's a phone book and the phone book was supposedly open to an emergency page with emergency numbers. Only nobody ever wrote any emergency numbers there. So it's one of those pages that just, back in the day, you had these empty pages you could add stuff to. You didn't have a 911, so you might add in, you know, police or whatever you put in your book. That was your emergency number. I suppose it was open to that page, but she'd been there six months and never written anything in it. So I'm, this whole thing about the emergency number she was trying to get, why? She never wrote anything there anyway. So why would she think there was anything? So theoretically, she starts to bleed and has some cramping. So she goes to the phone, starts bleeding all over the floor, tries to make a phone call, falls and onto the floor, rips the thing out. And then she staggers around the floor, you know, putting blood everywhere, hang, puts the phone in the trash can. And then because she can't make a phone call, she decides to, she goes out the door, down the driveway. Now, mind you, she just left her kids across the street at Barbara's house. You're looking for help? Wouldn't you go to Barbara's house? <laughs> okay. you, in other words, you're losing blood, so you lose your mind so much that instead of going straight to Barbara's house, you decide to wander down onto some other highway and crawl along someplace. But you go get your coat on the way because it's cold. Is this really what you would do if you were miscarrying? The whole thing is nonsense. It makes no sense whatsoever. And their dogs never went down the road. So she didn't walk down the road. So that that's just, to me, illogical. So the miscarriage thing just, just, just seems stupid to me. All right, let's push that away. The next one, abortion. Somebody said, always claiming people are having these back alley abortions prior to Roe v. Wade is like, Everybody thinks everything is sex trafficking today. And I think that's that's kind of an accurate statement. It's like, oh, not again. No. So anyway, the claim here was she didn't go to the dentist. The dentist is a pseudonym for abortionist. So, but there is proof she went to the dentist. So she didn't have time. And so now the idea is, okay, so if she didn't get it done at the dentist slash abortionist. Um, she got home and then... See how she does. She puts the baby down to sleep and then takes the child over and dumps the child over at Barbara's house, but doesn't tell Barbara like, again, hey, can you keep her here for a while? I got I got some business I need to take care of. She doesn't have to tell Barbara what the business is. She can just say, I got some stuff I got to take care of. I don't want to be disturbed for like an hour. Somebody's coming over, going to discuss taxes. She can make up anything. I don't think Barbara would have cared. She would have said, okay, fine. I'll, she said, I'll come back over and pick her up when I'm done. If you're going to have a, 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 an abortion in your house, I think you would make sure that nobody's coming in. You don't just drop your kid off and have Barbara roll into the kitchen going, Hey, Joan. Oh, look. <laughs> um, so, and disturb things now. So that's the first thing. It makes no sense. Secondly, where is she having this abortion at, by the way? Now, mind you, she's a, a middle-class woman with money. Um, I think she probably could find a way to get an abortion if she needed to that might be a little less squirrely than having somebody show up at your house with a knitting needle or or a, or a, a coat hanger. And the coat hanger sitting on the car was not used for an abortion. So somebody had can't comes in. Okay, so where where is this going to where's, where's this going to happen at? And some people say, "Okay, well she drank the beer bottles that were in there, you know, for, you know before she got this abortion, so she wouldn't be in so much pain." Did she have it on her bed in the bedroom? Is that why there are a few drops of blood in there? And um, then she started bleeding more. So she ran down the stairs and started bleeding out and tried to make a phone call for, for emergency help. And the abortionist says, oh, my God, you're going to wrap me out. And so you rip the or she ripped the phone away. And and then she bleeds some more all over the place and and grabs some pieces of clothing to stuff up her bottom to try to stop the bleeding. <laughs> I can't use that word. I don't know why I have a problem with that word. But anyway, stem the bleeding or prevent it from at least going down our legs. Um, and then, and then after that happens, the abortionist then says, okay, I'll take you to the hospital and drop you off. Now there's a little bit of sense here. Instead of calling 911 and having the abortionist discovered at the house, I'll, I'll give credit to this makes more sense. 
if, it, some, if that really happened at the house, the abortionist may not have wanted anybody to show up there because it, then it would mean an abortion occurred there and they would be on them. Yeah. If she dropped her off at the hospital and said, shut up, don't say anything, just say you started miscarrying. That makes a little more sense to me. Okay. So she gets her coat, her good gray coat, so she can bleed all over that, you know. Anyway, uh, and then they go out and um, she could have just taken the coat from the closet or she could have said, get that gray coat. And the abortionist follows her out to the out of the house and she, the abortionist takes the coat off, drops the hanger on top of her car and helps her into the coat and they get in the abortionist car. And then on the way there, the abortionist bails her out in the middle of the highway and doesn't take her to the hospital. And she wanders around and dies in the woods and gets eaten by a wolf. Or the abortionist decides she shouldn't even go to the hospital. So then the abortionist takes her away and kills her and buries her. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. I'll tell you why I don't go with this story. First of all, there's no evidence she was pregnant. Secondly, I think she would have a better way of doing an abortion, especially not in the middle of the day when everybody is racing around. Um, she did, and not making sure her daughter stayed away. Uh, it, it, there's so many ways she could have done it. She could have just dropped both kids off at Barbara's house, across the street and said, look, I'm going to be gone for three hours. I need to go do this, this, and that, and just go to an abortionist and come back home. I mean, that not make any sense that she, in the middle of a normal day, she would try to sneak an abortionist and get it done real quick and then continue on taking care of, no, that does makes no sense. All right. Second thing, let's say she's up in the bedroom lying on a, I don't know, on a, on, a, on a shower curtain and getting aborted. Okay. And she starts having cramping and she's starting to bleed. I'm going to say, if you are giving somebody an abortion, you should have things with you to stop bleeding from blood from just gushing everywhere. And so you would have something there. You would have, oh, I don't know, uh, sanitary napkins, even diaper sized things, you know, even she should have sanitary napkins and maybe diapers for the baby still around. Uh, he's two years old. Maybe he's potty trained, but she's got to have something. And what about the, nothing happened in the bathroom. Normally people go to the bathroom under these conditions and there's no blood in the bathroom. And I'm going to say, if she's, she's on a, a shower curtain bleeding in the bedroom, she's not going to be running around doing that. They're going to try to do something, put a towel between her legs, stop the bleeding not just going to be running around the house with blood pouring down her. It's just, you know, especially she's a good housekeeper. She's not, she's going to make sure that she's not bleeding everywhere. So this, this is just kind of just, you can, you can take pieces of information about a crime scene and just try to link them all together. And it just gets to the point where you're like, you know, you're creating a fictionalized story, which it's, it's pretty unlikely. I mean, could it have happened? Could it have happened? Well, I don't know why we see as much um, like the, the, the uh, I don't know why the table would be knocked over in the hallway, um, why this abortionist would suddenly just turn into a violent predator, <laughs> essentially, and, uh, and for force her not to, t you know, I mean, it just it, the whole thing just sounds like a silly story. Um, but you can you can fit things into it if you want to but it it doesn't make sense and if she's the woman wandering around on the uh highway what the, she got out of the car but the abortionist just said oh well whatever just let her wander around now is that good enough why didn't you go back and get her if you wanted to get rid of her he didn't do that and she just assumed well she'll just like what die on the side of the road and she didn't somebody else grabbed her and took her away <laughs> Her body's never been found. So, I mean, if she was staggering along the road, she pretty much would just drop over at some point. I just don't think that she'd be a, a big target for somebody else saying, oh, look, a bleeding looking homeless woman. I just can't wait to grab her. I mean, you know, say this doesn't make a lot of sense um, at all, but you can link things together if you want to do it, you know. Uh, and so where would I, so the mis miscarriage theory makes no sense because I, I I don't believe for a minute that she was miscarrying. She wouldn't have gone to the bathroom and put on a sanitary napkin, for God's sakes, and then used that and then walked out of the house, walked walk to the neighbor's house and get help. So the, mis the miscarriage thing, I think, is completely nonsense. 
So then we go to the abortion thing, which I think is close to nonsense, but I can string things together if I work hard at it. To say, okay, if I were talking to the police and they say, what do you think, Pat? I go, it's a stretch. It's a stretch. But if you want to look into an abortionist, be my guest. <laughs> Let me see what you say on that. And then I'll go to the, she staged a disappearance, which is the next one. Um, uh, I wouldn't think there'd be that much that early on because she wasn't showing or anything. So she'd never been to a doctor. So I'm going to say no. Usually it'd be like a heavy period. Um, uh, I'm not sure what that means yet. Um, maybe she tried to make a phone call for help after she was injured. And instead, the killer ripped it from the wall. Well, that is possible. But the question is, when was she injured? And was she injured through the through an abortion? I'll get to the next theory of uh, whether she's being attacked. That's a whole another another deal. Um, just dial the operator. Um, yeah, I think I'm trying to remember. But I well, okay, 60s. I was born in 55, so I do know my phone number. Do you have five four three seven zero? Drilled into my head by mommy. Um, but yes, I would think you could call the operator, and that would be it. You wouldn't need to. What's the point of looking up emergency numbers when you haven't written them? So yeah. Um, uh, Stephanie says she go to the neighbor. She couldn't call. I don't see any reason for her to walk off other than to seek help. Yes. I mean, and she did not go any place else, but the driveway or her neighbors. So in my opinion, what is obvious is that car means something because she didn't get in her own car. She didn't go to the neighbors and the dog never went down the street in any, at either direction. So if she didn't show up at Barbara's, which she didn't, she got in a car. And it wasn't hers. So I believe the car story 100%. That car was in her driveway. Somebody put it in the car. Could it have been an abortionist? I guess. But I mean, I'm having a hard time with that story. Um, let's see what else you have to say about the abortion story before I go on to the she went missing story. Um, yes, they saw a car driving away. That's, as I said, they did see some car back out, uh, car, a car was seen in her driveway and a car was seen backing out of her driveway within five minutes of each other. Uh, it was a blue gray, I think something like that. Um, they've never found the car, although there was, if you read his book, Ahern's book, which I think is good, um, he talks about how they did have, some people thought they saw a few numbers on it. Uh, and so they looked for that car and found supposedly maybe a stolen car, but that's very, very vague. Um, uh, there was also a car seen there five days earlier. And one of the suspects is a guy who was in the neighbor five days earlier, but not necessarily with that vehicle. So, um, but yes, a car was seen. So I 100% believe a car was used. She did not walk away. Absolutely did not walk away. Okay. So let's see. Let's see where we're at. Okay. So I'm just checking some more comments and then I'm going to go to uh, okay, let's go to this then, Loretta. Could she have done her own version of dad walks out for cigarettes and never came back to start a new life child free? All right. Well, first of all, she couldn't have walked away because she had to get in the car. <laughs> she had to have a person helping her. So the whole thing about she's uh, staggering down the highway without any of her stuff uh, looking disheveled. First of all, she just walked out of her house. I don't know why she has to look disheveled. But anyway, she's in her gray coat. She walks down the highway. But the dog did not go there. And if, you, if you're trying to sneak away, this is kind of a stupid way to sneak away by walking down the highway. All right. Um, so she got in a car. That means somebody had to drive her away. Now, some people said she had a lover. There's no evidence at all that she's ever had a lover. Nobody. There's no inkling of that. Um, okay, she could have a friend who is in you know, cohorts, you know, working with her on this. Okay. So would you stage a scene like this just to run away? Do you have, do you really, now mind you, she's, she supposedly adores her children. Nobody's ever said anything about she had any issues with her kids. Um, very good mom to them. She was, do you actually think she would want to leave, have her kids think her mother was murdered in this room or, 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 or whatever happened to her mother in this room and for the rest of their lives suffer from that. Would she want that? Could she just do a, a, a more like a vanishing thing? Or, I mean, you know, she could have driven her car and just jumped out someplace and vanished. She didn't have to leave a bloody crime scene. What, what did she do? 
uh, how did she get the blood there? Did she cut herself so she, and then just smear it places? None of it looks like a stage crime scene at all. And I'm going to later on uh, read another profiler's profile on this, uh, Mark Safrick, um, which was included in the book. And Mark Safrick, I'll get to him in a little bit at the end because I want to point out his profile and what he says about stage crime scene and all of that and the other possibilities. But this doesn't look like a stage crime scene to me. This looks like a mess. Um, and I will read his so you can understand the different issues of the stage crime scene. I don't want to repeat twice. So the reason people go on about her running away is because she once was a professional woman and she said she would like to teach sometime. Oh my God. So that means she wants to desert her family <laughs> and start all over someplace in the United States without kids. And they, the reason they're doing this is because she'd go to the library and take out books. Now, Apparently, they went through the book list of things she took out. And let me show you a couple, a few of them. All right. This is where you get into silliness. Oh, my God. It looks just like the table that fell over. Okay. So supposedly, she's reading books about women who go missing. Did she really read books about women who went missing? Oh, she's reading all these mystery stories and people going missing. First of all, she was a reader. She worked for her publisher. She reads a huge amount of stuff. She did read Queen of Scots. That was, you know, Mary Queen of Scots. That was the last thing she was reading. It's a story about, I'm going to tell you what I think she read these books that she did read. A story about an empowered woman. She was a woman herself who was very interested in women accomplishing things in life. And she loved reading. She was just a huge into reading. Now, your, your library only at the, in the 1960s had certain things and didn't have other things. And so she would go in and find what she finds and finds things that she thought were interesting. This one, Into Thin Air. Oh, my God. You see? Somebody went missing. This is a, this is a detective story. It's about, um, let's see, I think I even kept it up here. Um, uh, let me read you what it's about. And you tell me this sounds all that, oh, she's trying to figure out how to disappear. The Voice of America and Ed Tremont of the English Language Unit involved in the disappearance of Courtney Templeton, one of their difficult broadcasters. Templeton is responsible for a missing directive. Tremont finds a dead man and is fired. The FBI moves in as Tremont's fiance moves out, and Tremont finds solace in Templeton's daughter. Abduction, the Russians, and a photo finish chase, blah, blah, blah. It was an abduction. So, so this is a mystery story. How many mystery stories have you read that include a missing child, or abduction. God help you if your child goes missing and on your your nightstand is a story about Madeline McCann. <laughs> You're screwed. <laughs> okay. How about this one? Oh my God. The 27th wife. What was that one? About? I think this is the one that was about um, a Mormon lady who divorces. Let's see. I'm going to pull that one up just so you can hear what it really is. Because, say, everybody's going nuts about every one of these books is about her planning to run away uh, and, to, and to disappear. Uh, the 20, 27th wife. Whoops. I can't spell. 27th wife. All right. This story is about... She loved romance novels, too, by the way. Um, okay. Okay. The big passionate novel of a woman daring to live and love freely, no matter what the price. She was forced to choose between one man's love and her own pride as a woman. Brigham married one woman too many when he took Anna and Eliza, Eliza Webb as his 27th wife. This is about the Mormons. Um, he was the leader of the polygamous Mormon faith as powerful in the U.S. to Utah territories, the president of the United States. She was a great beauty with a quiet manner and an iron will. For, for four years, Eliza lived in Brigham Young's harem as his 27th wife. Then one summer morning, she walked out deserting her husband and suing him for divorce. <laughs> she didn't go missing. She sued him for divorce. It has nothing to do with staging a disappearance. Then we get here, incense to the idols. Okay, let's see what this one's about. Incense to the to idols. Okay, idols. All right, this one is about, okay, hold on, okay, from the flap, okay. Miss Ashton Warner's new novel expresses with a magical and sometimes frightening intensity, every woman's dream of herself as a femme fatale. Ooh. 
uh, the protagonist, a beautiful and brilliant French woman, has fled to New Zealand after the death of her husband. She fled to New Zealand after the death of her husband. Oh my God, she went missing. <laughs> yeah, I'm not going to go further with that. So you see what I'm saying? This is this is this is where nonsense comes in. Um, so there's not one thing, not any of her reading material that was proof of any kind of she wanted to disappear. There's nothing. And how would she would choose this way to disappear as a woman who likes everything neat and orderly? Oh, I guess she took the gray coat. That's it. And she's going to tear up her house and put blood everywhere, cut herself, put blood everywhere, and then run around on highways. This is, this is, <laughs> this is just plain silly. That one's sillier than the abortion one. I'd go with the abortion one first. So uh, miscarriage, no way. Uh, uh, running away, no way. Abortion, if you want to try to string things together, uh, I could leave that one on the table, although I don't buy it. <laughs> okay. Um, so, um, so sorry, Lila, I think you were on the uh, she ran away thing. <laughs> um, yep, sounds like those books were a few amongst many. She had she took she took a book out every week. She was a reader and she loved history. She was big into history and she was an English major, for God's sakes. So, yeah, no, no one husband is enough. <laughs> Could be true there, too. Um, uh, let's see. Um, uh could it be she went out briefly in the cold, putting on jacket and be caught off guard? Let me think for a second, Sarah. Um, yes. I, I'm going to get into the other possibility, which would be, okay, so we got the three we've done. Now we're down to somebody came to her house, attacked her, and then took her away. Could she have put on her coat to go out to pick up her daughter, for example, or go out to the garage and somebody then pulled in her driveway and came, came started talking to her and she's like, hey, you know, I'm not interested or whatever, started going in the house and he followed her and attacked her. Yes, then she might have on the gray coat. Now, I, don't, I can't quite figure out whether it's a good gray. They say it's a look, it was a nice gray coat. So is it that the last time she wore the trench coat, it was chilly and she just grabbed the other one? Uh, is there a reason there's a hanger on top of the car? That hanger is weird. And I'm having, I have trouble figuring that one out. I, I do. One of the problems we have with certain cases is you got that one thing that you go. And I, since I decided to do this case, I have not had enough time to spend on that damn hanger. <laughs> You know, last night I was like dreaming of that stupid hanger in the middle of the night. I kept waking up like, what about the hanger? You know, <laughs> and I don't have a good answer for the hanger. The abortion is one of I said, the guy could have, she could have said, get my coat. And he gets the coat, walks out behind her. She walks out behind her and takes that off and tosses it and says, here's your coat. Possible? Sure. Um, that, you know, but that, you know, that I'm making up a story to go with that. Um, but I don't really have. I don't know. Here's the other thing I don't know. The coat was missing. I don't know if the hanger was missing. So that's a whole other issue. Was the hanger missing? Uh, in other words, was the reason that he knew the gray coat wasn't there is because the hanger was still there? And he's like, well, some, somebody took the coat off the hanger. If that's true, the hanger on the car has nothing to do with the coat in the house. The hanger in the car maybe had to do with the uh, guy with the uh, dry cleaning. Maybe he... Put the, you know, maybe he left it on, maybe it dropped it and she picked it up, put it on her car and left it there accidentally. It could be just had nothing to do with the crime. You see where these things get tricky. But yes, I think you could be correct. She could have put the coat on to go out for some reason and then got attacked at that point or, and, or chased into the house at that point. So yes, I think so. All right. Now let's go to theories on what could have happened. Uh, first, I'm going to read you the theory from the book, um, because I just think it, 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 it goes to show, again, trying to put all these things together. And then I'm going to go to Safric's theory. Um, so let me let me go find it. Um, so this is the author's theory. And um, I found it interesting, <laughs> shall we say. Okay, wait a minute. I've got to go race to the end of his book. Okay, where is his theory? Okay, here we go. Now, his theory is based on 
this is the this is the the uh, adoptive father who supposedly maybe sexually assaulted her or did in some way. Okay. And supposedly had some issues with her over the years. And in and, and recent, uh, like a month prior, she had talked to the adoptive mother and said something about him, which was less than polite um, and maybe recommended she just not spend time with him, whatever. But so at any rate, um, the, the, the author, by the way, doesn't believe any of the sightings of her are her. And I tend to agree with him on that. Um, I think he's correct. Now, Frank is the name of the, fa the, the father, Frank. Um, so she thinks that he had something to do with what happened to her, that he wanted her to go, he wanted to, basically was mad at her and wanted to do something to her. However, let's, say, let's see, um, Frank, that was her adoptive father, was 60 years old at the time. And his son was only 28. That was one of the kids that she grew up with, one of her brothers. In 1961, an age more associated with violent crime. Okay, so now this is interesting. Why is he trying to bring Ben the adoptive brother, or the, well, it's her step, I don't know what you want to call him. She was adopted into the family and he became her brother. And they seem to get along. Um, the father's 60 and he's 28. So now the author is trying to say that, why is he trying to say that the son is of the age, which associated with violent crime? I'll tell you why. Because he says in the next sentence, Frank had a solid alibi for October 21st, 1961. <laughs> so he wants to make the father, the adoptive father, the one who, did something to Joan, but he's got a solid alibi, totally solid. So now he's got to bring in somebody else to help out daddy, which is Ben, because he doesn't have a solid alibi. All right. Um, but there's several facts, he says, that point away from Ben. His fingerprints did not match the prints at the Risch crime scene. Okay. And the detective also thought the loss of his stepsister truly grieved Ben. Aha. Uh -huh. But... Now, the author desperately wants to make the father, the adoptive father, the reason for this crime and not a stranger crime, right? He says, knowing that Joan and Martin's schedule and habits, which they might, Ben and his accomplice, ah, that's where the fingerprints came from. Now, <laughs> the, father is, uh, the father has gotten his son to do his dirty work, and Ben, is, instead of just doing it by himself, brings along some buddy of his that just doesn't mind doing it bad things too. <laughs> um, they, they could have, this is where you start the coulds, could this and could that, could, you be, could be making up a story. Sorry, sorry, uh, buddy. Um, but they could have driven to the Rish house between 2.30 and 3.15 p.m. on October 24th and parked at the end of the driveway. Whether his confederate approached the house at this point or entered later, Joan let her stepbrother into her home. Uh, ben used the pretext of being in the area and wanting to discuss the internal family dispute over whether Alice and Frank should reunite in New Rochelle. That would be the mother, the stepmother and the stepfather, or what do you want to call it? adoptive mother and father. The conversation quickly went very badly. At first, Ben may have argued that there was no good reason that Frank was living in diminished circumstances without his wife, the youngest daughter and sister to share his difficult life. If that argument failed, then Ben or his friend may have been forcibly demanded that she cease accusing Frank of abuse and cease opposing Alice and Elvalen's return to live with him. So in other words, supposedly Joan had told her adoptive mother that, hey, you know, I just think, you know, you've separated from Frank, maybe you shouldn't go back, you know. Um, so Frank's pissed at her. And so now the son's over there trying to convince her to just shut the hell up. Eventually they may have demanded, <laughs> may, they could have, demanded that she come with them to see her, see her stepfather, as if that was going to work and threatened that they would hurt her and her children if she did not come along with them quietly. Joan, however, so, so by the way, I guess she's supposed to leave her son unattended or something. Just go with them to go talk to her stepfather. I mean, this is just a, this story doesn't just make any sense at all. Uh, Joan, however, had vowed after her parents died that she would never allow her children to go through the trauma that she had endured in her childhood. And she decided to resist her assailants and defy her stepfather. Perhaps she attempted to reason with them or sensing some hesitancy on their part. She decided to call their bluff by reaching for her phone to call for help, maybe pushing the telephone table that was beneath the wall phone between the men threatening her. Enraged by this defiance, Ben's accomplice lunged forward at her, pushed the telephone table onto its side and into the hallway leading to the stairs, spilling a roll of drawing paper, a telephone book, and one of Lillian's drawings onto the floor. Holding himself steadily with one hand, on the corner of the hallway entrance and accidentally leaving his prints there, Joan's assailant 
this is just the guy who came along for the ride, <laughs> tore the phone receiver out of Joan's hand and then ripped the telephone cord off the wall phone. And then either struck Joan repeatedly with his fist or other, some other small weapon that he had brought into the house concealed in a jacket or in a pair of trousers. Stung by the ferocity of the attack and bleeding profusely from her nose and mouth, Joan slipped down the wall and onto the floor. We don't see that evidence there at all because she would... Um, under the phone, her attack had then began hitting her on the floor. During this brutality, blood flowed onto the floor and spattered on the baseboard and walls. Joan attempted to crawl away from her attacker and perhaps pull herself up using the dining room doorway. Do, do, doing so spread her blood along the floor's walls and doorway, but her assailant, grabbing her by the leg or arm before she could rise up, spun her in a, a quarter circle into the center of the floor, always keeping a step ahead of Joan's blood, because there were no footprints. Um, then the scene quieted. Temporarily exhausted and struggling for normal breath, both Joan and the perpetrator ceased their one-sided combat. Uh, with Joan on the floor, uh, in shock on the floor, smeared with her blood, and her assailant standing over her, breathing hard. Joan lay on the floor for several minutes while her attacker stood near her, but on the side of the kitchen where no violence had occurred and no blood had spread. The whole violent struggle lasted less than a minute. Ben stood off to the side of the kitchen, not wanting to participate in the violence, but determined not to disappoint his father again. One of the, one of the men gave Joan something to wipe blood from her nose and mouth, and she held her head back to staunch, Darn, that's the word, staunch, <laughs> staunch, it is staunch. Why did I say stench? Staunch the blood. The stench is a smell, isn't it, though? Staunch the blood still dripping off her face. As soon as her bleeding had mostly stopped, the men got Joan to her feet and started moving her through the dining room, then up the stairs where David was probably crying in his crib. Blood from Joan's nose or her clothes dropped once at the bottom of the stairs, twice at the top of the stairs, and in David's room. Going into David's center bedroom, Joan made efforts to calm him and clean him, but interesting enough, no blood was ever on that child. But the perpetrators did not allow her to change him. They stood behind her, menacing both David and Joan, without saying a word. Alternatively, if Barbara Barker had seen jo Joan chasing David down her driveway, oh Lord, I mean, we get into double that. By this time, let's get rid of that. By this time, Ben needed his father to tell him what to do. Coming out of David's room, Ben took her into the master bedroom and shook her, telling her that she would be leaving the house and getting into his car with them. He threatened that she'd better not scream or he would hurt David in his crib. In the process of shaking Joan, he caused some drops of blood to scatter on surfaces in the master bedroom. Coming downstairs, Joan began to reason with Ben, hoping that if she delayed long enough, someone would rescue her. She told her attackers she would go with them, but she was horrified that her children would be traumatized by seeing the bloody kitchen scene, and she begged them to let her clean it up. Ben temporarily... Ben temporarily relented, hoping that if she calmed down enough, it would make uh, be easier to get her down the driveway with minimum of noise. Joan pulled the wastebasket from under the sink and placed it in the center of the room. Picking up the phone receiver, she placed it on top, the top lip of, of the bucket, and she began to clean the floor with anything nearby. Getting increasingly nervous, however, Ben and his friend stopped the cleaning process and made Joan get her coat from the closet. Absently, she put on her gray coat. In her nervous state, she did not think to take her bag or her keys. Word that she might try to break away from them and begin screaming outside, one of the assailants pulled her close to him in a tight grip. They made her carry the things she had used to clean as they walked to his car. And as she pressed closer to her own Chevrolet in the driveway, the residual blood on Joan's hands or the cleaning rags left blood on the front hood of her car and two streaks on the right fender. Joan may have struggled near the back of her Chevy and Ben or his accomplice pushed her over the trunk of her own car where she left another blood stain. Then they pushed her prone into the back seat of his car, got into the car themselves, dropped back out of the wrist driveway in front of Hilda Ziegler's car. That was one that saw the, 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 the other car that has never been identified. Of course, you know, Ben had a car um, that wasn't his, so I guess we'll see a, the accomplice's car that no one ever knew about. Um, <laughs> in the absence of physical or eyewitness evidence, it's difficult to speculate what happened next. Well, it was diff difficult to speculate what happened in the room, but you did it. <laughs> anyway, apparently, somewhere along the way, they drove away with her, and they don't know what happened. Maybe she had, maybe she may have seen Frank, and somebody killed her later, or someone could have killed her during the car ride. Perhaps she tried to escape. Alternatively, her injuries may have been more severe than were would be inferred from only a half a pint of blood in the kitchen. She may have died in the car, and the two 
men disposed of her in a remote area of any of four states. <laughs> oh my goodness. What happened? <clears throat> okay. Um, that was probably one of the worst profiles I've ever read. Now, <laughs> Again, the book is great. Stephen Ahern, love your book. I recommend people re write, read it. But you're doing what YouTubers do that aren't profilers or detectives. You've got this whole thing going well, and then you come up with this absolutely, completely foolish, uh, um, um, what do you want to even call it? Dr dramatization of the scene. Taking each little thing you can think of and trying to find a way to fit it into your determination that her that her adoptive father had something to do with it. That is not the way things work. And the fact that the adoptive father was had an alibi, now you're trying to say Ben doesn't, but Ben's fingerprints aren't there, so he has to have a, a friend come with him. You're just making up stuff. And the whole scene in there is ludicrous. So no, I don't think that makes any sense. I don't think the stepfather had anything to do with it. So what'd you all think of that, guys? Uh, <laughs> what'd you think of that story? Oh my goodness. Um, <laughs> that's a good, uh, oh, <laughs> why not have a, we have a Barbara Love angle in there. I don't know. Maybe she could have something going on with the brother, you know, cockamamie story. I'll go with that, Nicole. Yeah. This was a profile shaking the woman. <laughs> well, it's, it's a, it's a non-profiler profile. It's what I hear, see on YouTube all the time. And that, and then what the problem isn't so much that he proposed this as a, a, a theory, it's that people buy into it. They go, oh, that's a good theory. And I see this on YouTube all the time. And then, you know, now Stephen Ahern only made, had one book on this case. But if somebody had a YouTube channel, they would have 50, 50 things on how the, the, the adoptive father was involved. And they just go on for 50 different videos. And they have people hanging on every word because they don't understand how things work. So, yeah, it's sensational. That is surely that. Um, <laughs> it, it's and it's irrational, irrational. Yep, like you're making up stuff, Pat. <laughs> Luckily, not me. Yes, it's also um, very irrational. And where was the uh, fantastical thinking? Yep, illogical. This is this is what I see. Um, I need a glass of wine after that speed reading session. I had to read it fast. It's just too ludicrous. Okay, let me go to a profiler's view of this. All right, and the profiler I'm going to refer to in his profile, as I'm actually giving somebody else another profiler's profile. How about that? I rarely do that, but okay. Here he is. Um, this is um, uh, this is uh, Mark Safrick. He runs uh, Forensic Behavioral Services. He is a retired FBI guy. Uh, he's been on TV a lot. Um, he's been around. Um, it's interesting. Um, here it says here here from Mark Safrick, a, a former member of the FBI's Behavioral Science. Unit. This was back in 2012. He was speaking at the Law and Justice Conference at George Washington University. Um, and if, oddly enough, when I looked that up, I also was at that conference, criminal profile of Pat Brown to address students uh, attending Lead America's Law and Justice Conference. So we were both there. I don't remember. I don't remember if I knew he was there um, uh, or not. Now, most of you know I'm not fond of FBI profiling methodology. I find it too. Uh, too uh, statistically based and too uh, guess too much guesswork, not based on evidence. A lot of times, um, some of their profiles, I they just say, "Oh, the, I think he's a a white guy who lives with his mother and has a green car and a dog." And I'm like, "Where did you get that from a crime scene? If you can't prove it from the crime scene, you shouldn't say it." Uh, I find a lot of the FBI profiles over the years have done just that, and it really bothers me. And I don't think it's an accurate method of profiling. I think but profiling should be deductive profiling, which is based on evidence. And you you look at the evidence and you support everything you say with evidence. Now, evidence does not always prove out your theory based on evidence is not always correct in the long run. But at least if you're going to say something, you should say the reason I'm saying this is because the evidence tells me this. The reason I say she went away in a car is not because I think it's a nice idea. <laughs> it's because the dogs did not go any place but her driveway and across the street. So I do not know how she would have left the property if she wasn't in a vehicle. To me, the evidence supports that she left in a vehicle. Now, is it possible a horse came by and she jumped on it and rode away? 
I guess, you know, is it possible for whatever reasons the dog completely lost her scent and didn't realize what was going on? He's a terrible dog. Maybe. But based on the fact there was a car seen in her driveway and backing out about the time that she disappeared, I'm going to go with the evidence supports a car was used in her leaving the house. Okay, so so I'm going to stick with that because I think that that but I want I want evidence to support things. Okay, like people think this. Oh, she 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 ran away because blah blah. The evidence doesn't support that. There's no books that support that. There's no, there's no friends that support that she was unhappy. There was no, there was just no proof. There was not one shred of evidence that said she ran away. Not nothing. So I won't go there because it's just, it doesn't exist. All right. Let's see if I can find Mark Safrick's uh, statement now. Where is it? Mark, where are you? Hold on a second. Shoot. Oh, I hit something wrong. Okay. Where are you? Okay. I have, I have these things highlighted. Of course, I can't find the right highlight now. Okay. Oh, here we go. All right. So he says, I contacted a former FBI profiler, Mark Safrick, to help me sort through this maze of possibilities. Now, I want to say this. I don't always agree with other profilers' profiles. Um, and just because I don't always agree with their profiles doesn't mean I think they're a bad profiler for everything. Um, every profiler might disagree with another profiler at a point in time. I also don't have to like a profiler personally to, to think his profile is good. So either way, you know, uh, I look at each individual profile that is put out by a profiler. It doesn't matter what my opinions of the profiler and his previous work are. I just want to know, is this a good profile? And I personally don't, I, I can't remember if I ever met Mark Safrick, so I have no opinion of him. So just saying, I don't know if he has an opinion of me. Couldn't find it on the internet. Sometimes I can profile. Some profilers have spoken out very negatively about me. I didn't find something he said anything about me. So that's good. Not that he likes me, but, you know. <laughs> but anyway, I'm reading his profile. So the pro he says the cr crime scene did not appear staged. Why? Excellent work he did here. In Mark Safrick's opinion, a person staging a crime scene needs to carry out his or her activity to a logical conclusion. Understand the sequential and temporal aspects of the crime flow and avoid those are all difficult to understand and avoid excessive and unnecessary behavior designed to convince law enforcement that the actions staged are legitimate. So in other words, this is, this is what he's really trying to say. In his view, several aspects of the crime scene seem out of place if she were trying to stage a clean, uh, clean crime scene. Let me, let me throw the crime scene up behind me. Um, okay, let me just throw up, uh, let's see. No, no, not that one, where is it? Okay, let's put this one up here. Okay. So maybe I like the other one better. All right, let's do let's do this one. All right. Um, for example, there's no reason to put the trash can in the middle of the floor. If you're trying to prove a violent abduction, that that's what she's trying to stage is a violent abduction. Why would she put the trash can in the middle of the floor? Remember, I said I think the trash can was just something she took out earlier to take take away. You, that's not you don't stage a crime scene by saying, "Gee, I think a killer in the midst of attacking me." is going to take this out and put it in the floor. <laughs> that makes sense. So that, that was one thing. Ripping the phone off the wall would make sense staging a crime scene. And, but leaving it haphazardly on the floor would cause the police to immediately surmise that a violent crime had been committed. But instead, the trash bucket and the dangling phone receiver would cause the police to be confused, which everybody is confused. We are wondering, aren't we now? Why is that... Why is that... Um, there's my picture of the, uh, yeah. Why is there a phone hanging from the bucket? We don't know. I mean, that is one of those things in the crime scene that make you go, what happened? And if she just wants to show she got attacked, yeah, rip the phone thing out, chuck that sucker on the floor. That would be the simple way of doing it. So he's noticing that that doesn't make sense if she were trying to stage the crime scene. Um, that would make them consider alternative theories to a violent attack. And it goes on. The blood spatter noted both on the stairs, top and bottom, as well as in the children's room and master bedroom are difficult to explain in an actual crime. We're, I mean, I have trouble trying to figure out how that works, right? Unless you go with uh, Ahern's version of how, <laughs> how this crime went down. <laughs> I, I can't explain it exactly. I have some ideas, but it's still tough. 
Um, so she's not going to think, oh, I should, let's see, I, I cut my hand. I'm going to drop a couple drops here. I'm going to drop drops in every room. That's going to prove I was violently attacked. No, it's not. That makes no sense. Um, in a staged event, they're created by the stager, but to what purpose? I would not expect to see them in a staged scene. In addition, blood spatter cast off patterns appeared on some walls. Such patterns are normally seen when a bloody hand or a weapon is moving to strike. How would Mrs. Rich known to have made such a pattern back in 1961? Blood spatter stuff wasn't as a big deal back then. Um, she wasn't a detective. She was. She did read a lot of books, but yeah. Uh, the location of the overturned table in the hallway between the kitchen and the stairs also raised questions in Mark Safrick's mind. Again, in staging, the idea is to create what would seem reasonable in a struggle. What I would have expected is to see the disruption of the table from its normal position to a disturbed position within the kitchen, not in the hallway. So again, that she would just knock it over where it stands. Um, Rich would, would have wanted law enforcement to find a weapon. I don't agree with that. That I don't agree with. So Safrik and I disagree on that. She would want law enforcement to find a weapon. Not necessarily. I mean, a lot. I think almost everybody knows a killer often brings a weapon and takes a weapon away. So I don't think she's going to have to. Well, she could pick up a, uh, I guess she could take a fire, fire, a poker from a fireplace and put some of her blood on and drop it on the ground. She could get a knife out of the drawer and go like that and drop it. She could have staged it that way. That's true. Then there will be a weapon at the scene proving something really bad happened. But so uh, would she have done that? I don't know whether she would have thought of that. So I, I, I'm on the fence on that. Yeah, maybe he's right. But I also don't know that the, as, she, as long as she thinks there's blood in the place and she knocks stuff over, that would be enough. Uh, and then she's being then she's being taken away. So she's not being killed there. So I sort of disagree with him on that. Um, no money or valuables were removed from the house, either making a botched burglary unlikely. And that is often done in a stage thing where you you either make it look like a sex crime or you make it look like a, a burglary gone wrong. And that's not, there's no evidence of that at the house. So there's no, there's just staging just doesn't work. So in Mark Safrick's opinion, a voluntary disappearance was the least likely explanation for her disappearance. Uh, let me go on a little bit more. So I also agree. That's the least likely that she staged anything. In Mark Safford's opinion, most of the explanations of an accident or medical emergency did not focus sufficiently on uh, the, the Rich Kitchen, but instead, most of these explanations have been worked backward, the wrong approach, from the pur purported sightings of Rich on various roadways walking in three different directions at three different distances. With that information treated as fact, many people have tried then to explain why and how she would have gotten there. So as far as violence by a stranger goes, Profiler Mark Safrick offered the following analysis to his report on the jo Joan Rich case. This brings us to what I feel is the most likely explanation for why Joan Rich disappeared that day. Joan Rich was attacked in her home and after that attack was removed by the offender in a vehicle. She may have been alive at that time and was killed at a subsequent time and location with her body being disposed of. All right. So Mark Safrick believes it is a stranger abduction or a near stranger abduction. Essentially, when I say near stranger, there 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 are a couple there are a couple interesting suspects. One was a guy who was coming around. Uh, his name was uh, Foster, and he had been there a week before, talking to the women about the uh, something to do with the park system and giving up houses for the park system. He had been there a week before, and some of the women didn't like his demeanor. They, they he overstayed his welcome, and they found him creepy. A person like him who had been there in the neighborhood before and saw how the women were functioning, made, and all, she, he also did see Joan the week before. Um, I think it was Richard, was it Richard Foster? Um, I think that was uh, his name. Um, and he, they, they supposedly had a, um, an, an alibi, but the alibi was kind of strange. His boss said, oh yeah, uh, that way back then at that point in time, we had lunch together at this exact hour as if his boss would know that it seemed a little shaky. Like maybe the boss was just trying to have his back. Um, apparently I think they said they maybe didn't take his fingerprints. I don't know why, but he was in the neighborhood previously had been at Jones house a week before and was kind of creepy. Did he note how she handled, she was home and how she handled the kids and then knew that area. So he drove in that day and said, I'll go back and talk to her again. And uh, maybe something will happen and then maybe something did happen. I don't know. 
So it could be a total stranger, a stalker type, or it could be a semi-stalker type and not a tire stranger, but somebody that she had been uh, familiar with at least and had a way to then come back into her house and talk to her again. Um, or as uh, Sarah points out, maybe she came out, he was out in the driveway and she put her coat on to come outside and, and he, he, he freaked her out and she ran back to the house and he took off after her. Now you would wonder, well, what about him worrying about somebody seeing her? Well, as I pointed out, most of it was uh, trees around and she, she's home alone. There's trees around. You know, he, he, you could always say, well, somebody could pull up and find out what I'm doing because it's not the middle of the night. It's kind of stupid. But, hey, somebody did do something, as I always point out. So when we say somebody wouldn't do that, the fact is somebody did do that. So let's not say somebody didn't do that because they did. <laughs> okay, so now what happened in the house? How would I profile this crime? Well, boy, is that tricky. Um one thing they said was they, they, they didn't seem to think there was a sexual assault. I don't know that I agree with that. Um, I'll tell you why I don't necessarily agree with that. Um, there's no proof she was alive when she left that house. No proof at all. Um, she was dead on the floor and somebody decided to remove her from the house. Now you could ask, why would anybody do that? Why not just run? Get, jump in your car and get the hell out of there. And I don't have a good answer for that. Usually when people remove bodies from houses, it's because it's in their house. <laughs> you know, it's like, whoa, you know, she came over for a date and killed her. You know, there's a good reason to get the body out of your house. Um, if your husband has killed his wife, good reason to get the body out of the house. Um, it's somebody else's house. Usually the body's left there. This is true. So usually when somebody takes somebody from a house, it's because they want to kidnap them um, and they're not already dead. So in reality, it seems more likely that the guy went in there to do something. But the question is what? And I don't go, I don't go with the silly story of uh, Ahern's. I just I can't buy that one. Uh, so the, the only usual reason a guy goes into a woman's house and attacks her is because it's a sexual thing. It's a, he's going to be a, a rapist of some sort. Um, and I don't believe she went and looked up any phone number. So I think that that whole thing is just that, that the, 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 um, the table was knocked over in a struggle. Uh, the phone is interesting. Um, the question would be, if you're in the middle of being attacked, I know there are some people who say, well, the women, uh, they'll go run for the phone. Now, it depends when they go running for the phone. Sarah, you had a point there. If she were in the driveway and was trying to escape the guy, going into the house, and I don't know, didn't have a chance, maybe she was thinking she was, she was going to run to the phone and start calling, to call the operator and say, send help. Um, or threatening the guy, I'm going to call the, I'm going to call the police because the police are close by. They lived, I think the police were five minutes away. Then she might have decided to pull that, try that phone thing, but not because she wasn't looking up phone numbers. She would might try that because she might thought there was a, some type of distance in time um, that she would have that time to do it. it. It's not usually, doesn't usually work. And in that case, then probably he came in bursting right in after her and ripped that phone right out of her hand. Um, yes. Um, and then what happened? Uh, and the, the, the most logical thing is at that point he assaulted her, uh, physically. And that's what caused the bleeding that, and whether he obviously didn't seem to, well, it doesn't appear that he stabbed her, not that much blood, but again, it depends where you stabbed the person, how much blood is coming out. Um, whether he hit her over the head with something, whether he broke her nose, um, and blood started gushing out of her nose, um, it could be a number of those things. Um, and just, there was obviously movement. So then you have to look at the movement and say, well, it's not like the guy got shot her in the head and she just dropped because there's too much movement in this house. Things being knocked over, um, <clears throat> blood in different places and some blood upstairs. And so the question is, why the heck is the blood upstairs? And now there's two, there's two possibilities. One is that she ran, she ripped the phone out of her hand and she ran upstairs to escape him because he, he was now blocking the door. The phone is dead. She doesn't want to be dead. He's blocking the door. 
She could go out the front of the house, but maybe there's a reason she couldn't get out that way. So she ran upstairs, maybe to protect her child. Maybe she thought she could lock herself in a room with the child. Don't know. Did he get upstairs and then punch her in the nose? And then she went like this and there's some little drops as she escaped down the stairs or tried to escape down the stairs. So there were some drops going down. Um, and then he caught her in the kitchen and, and hit her worse and more blood came about. Possible. Other possibility is that he knocked her out after he beat her. She's on the floor. He knocks her out. He's got blood on his hands. And he hears a baby scream. And just, he wonders if anybody else is upstairs. He runs up the stairs, drops a few things of blood, looks in, looks in, comes back down. Could be something like that. I can't link everything together because it's foolish to try. But one of those things had to happen. Somebody went upstairs. Somebody came downstairs. Either her or him. Could be both, but uh, most of the action did take place down here. Now, the next question comes down to the phone on the, this, this, this thing, the phone on the trash can. The trash can, I believe there is just there because it's there. The phone being there, as I say, I think it was more, it wasn't carefully placed necessarily. It could have just been dropped on top and it slid. But why even there? Because the location of it is not, let me see if I can show you. The location of it is there in front of the sink, between the sink and the refrigerator. That's on the other, and the, uh, the phone is down to the right um, on that wall over here. Okay, let me, where's my better picture of the phone? Yeah, so it's, you know, so it's a little bit of a distance away. But now, here's the thing. You rip that phone out of her hand, you might be both staggering back. If you stagger back enough, you might be right over that, over that trash can and just drop it. That's a possibility. So again, let's not make a big fancy thing out of it. Also, let me let me go with another possibility. Because one thing it was real the 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 uh, phone is really good for, not the phone itself, but the but the uh, but the receiver with the with the cord. That's great for strangling people. So it's also possible that he attacked her. She didn't actually go for the phone. He reached up, grabbed that thing and wrapped it around her neck and strangled her. And when he was finished strangling her, he pulled it off her neck and just dropped it. And it happened to be next to the trash can. That could have happened. Um, could she have been sexually assaulted? Why not? I don't understand why they're saying she couldn't be sexually assaulted. I mean, she's got blood on her. The blood is on the ground. Some of it's moved around a bit. Some looks like it's been removed. Maybe just it's just gotten maybe she did put that coat on and it's just just on the back of the coat i mean he could if he took the body with him you can't tell that she was sexually assaulted or not you have no idea there's no semen gonna maybe no semen's going to be there maybe the coat was long and he just had to push it up uh push up her dress and but she i think she was wearing a dress in the old days people wore dresses you didn't have to deal with those stupid pants when you want to rape people and you know he could easily just assault her he doesn't even have to take her underwear off he could do that. He could have sexually assaulted her right there, strangled her. She could have died on the floor. Or she could have not died on the floor. And he's once he was finished, he just decides, oh, oh. and this is the, you see, the DNA wasn't big back then. So again, you wonder why would he take the body? Well, first of all, let's say she wasn't quite dead. Let's say he used a strangle, strangling thing during the, the act of uh, raping her and she didn't die, just... You know, some of them just like to play with the strangulation thing, you know, a little bit worse, ah, you know, a little bit, you know, then release a little bit. That's a fun thing for rapists. Um, maybe he didn't. Maybe then at the point where she was had been raped once, he just dropped the phone and they said, get up, took her out of the, pushed her out of the house, said, you're coming with me, took her out to the car somewhere along the way, they, the blood on the coat or whatever, touched something. Then he threw her in the car, put her in the back, trunk of his car, who knows, and drove away and dumped her someplace. Or buried in the backyard of his house. Or maybe she was dead. Maybe he strangled her and she was dead on the floor. Maybe he decided, hey, if if I leave her here, it's a murder investigation. If I leave her here, they're going to know I raped her. It's rape and murder. It's a sexual homicide. But if I take her, they won't know what exactly happened here. And maybe that's why. Maybe he did try to clean up. People say he tried to clean up. And I find that a little hard to believe. Maybe he did start and say, well, we get some rid of some of the blood. It won't look so bad. And then he takes the body. Walks it right out, chucks, chucks it in the trunk of his car and drives away. That to me is much more logical. So I can't detail everything that happened in this room, exactly when it happened. All I can say is 
my profile, I think, makes a lot more sense than anything super, super fanciful. It is the way criminals work. They're not always that bright either. They, they, they don't necessarily even think things through before they do them. That's why I say the, the foster character, I don't know if it was him or not, um, but if he was in the neighborhood and he, he liked her, he came back, thought he'd chat her up and maybe see where that was going to go because some people think that that's always going to go somewhere. Or maybe he wasn't intending to chat her up. Maybe he just realized she'd be there by herself down that driveway and he could just pull in and, and hey, if she wasn't home or somebody was there with her, he could just say, hey, I'm here. I'm back here from last week. And nobody suspects anything. He just drive away. But if he goes in there and she's alone, bingo. And maybe he thinks, you know, doesn't worry about whether his car is going to be seen because it's he thinks it's in the trees there. You know, they're not that bright. Or maybe it wasn't that Paul Foster guy. Maybe it's just some other guy who doesn't care if his car is seen because he figures nobody, he stole the damn car anyway. <laughs> it's a stolen car. He's seen her in the neighborhood before. He stole a car. He says, hey, opportunity. I'll roll in and see what happens. And then dump the car and her. So that would be my way, after all of this, of profiling it. Taking away all the silly profiles that just are being made up and exaggerated and are unlikely to be true and going with stuff that makes sense. Um, so I think this was probably a stranger or near stranger homicide, sexual homicide. And I don't buy for a minute that sex wasn't, that wasn't a, a, a serial rapist or serial killer. I believe that that's per perfectly reasonable because why else? You know, why else? Okay, I'm gonna go to your comments now. All right, where's my little soda? <laughs> All right, let's see. Um, okay, well, there's a good point. The male had never. Thank you, Sarah. You're 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 on the you're on the mark today. Again, we can't prove this happened, but it's a possibility. The male was still in the mailbox. Um, she passed by it. Maybe she got to the house. And she was cold the last time she was out in that damn, you know, raincoaty thing, and it was just colder out. And she's like, she just grabbed the other coat to go to the mailbox to keep warmer. Maybe true because, and she never quite got there. Some that guy pulled in the driveway and it all didn't go well after that. Can't prove that, but that makes more logical sense than a whole lot of other stuff. Um, let's see. She was not pregnant. We do not know she was not pregnant, but we have no proof that she was pregnant. There was zero proof that she was pregnant. And, and it was also, there's no proof that she wouldn't want to just go ahead and have the kid. I mean, the concept of this would be that she went behind her husband's back to get rid of a baby that was his because she had no proof she had a lover. She went behind her husband's back to have, to have a, uh, an illegal abortion in her own house instead of having the kid because what it would delay her, her uh, return to professional life for two more years. Well, big deal. I mean, this happens to women all the time. We don't, we don't necessarily do things that are, that are dangerous and illegal because of that. Now, she, she had a stable home. So it's a big difference if you're, you know, a teenager or somebody, uh, bad circumstances. She wasn't. She, they had money. They had a lot of money. Nice home. She could have done the third kid. You know, uh, I think my mother only intended to have two kids. And then I came along. <laughs> Thank you, mom. <laughs> you know, and she wasn't, my mother was never a mommy sort. Um, she she wasn't. She admitted it. Um, she was in the ice capades, and then she she later in her life she became a watercolor artist. She was a good mom. She she sewed clothes. She took care of us, cooked food every night. She hated cooking. She did that anyway. She wasn't a cuddly, warm type of mom that just just delighted in having three children in her life. But she was good to all of us. She 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 you know she took us to our music lessons and all this kind of stuff. She just wasn't. I think if it had been another time, she would have maybe chosen not to get married. I just, I just think she was probably more of a free spirit that got, you know, in the 1950s stuck where she was. Uh, but she was, she, she didn't. Also, I'm not saying she hated her life either. She accepted her life and she found things that made her happy within her life. And my father was good to her, and um, when she became an artist, he, he, um, they still went skating all the way through our, you know, our my growing up and. And my father built all these, um, you know, uh, for, so she, all the stands so she could go do art shows. He built all those for her. He drove her places for doing. She was good, for, good husband to her. Uh, and we were good kids. 
most of the time. And uh, she was a good mom. So I just think just because she would have gotten pregnant with me when she's like, dang it, I wish I only had two. I just can't see my mother, who was also in good circumstances, choosing to have a, a dangerous abortion behind my father's back. I mean, you know, just because somebody can do that doesn't mean they have any reason to do that or would choose that. Um, just because, gee, maybe I'd rather work two years earlier. You know, that's just a little excessive. Um, let's see. Um, what else you have to say here? Uh, uh, no, not that I know of, TR. Um, no, I mean, you know, of course, this is years later. Um, there are a lot of salacious headlines, you know, uh, thrown out there. If you watch the little video that uh, I linked, um, uh, that, that I will link um, below, uh, I'll put the I'll put the link to the book and the link to the one video that didn't appall me on YouTube, and uh, you'll see a lot of the, of the um, articles and all the, the the horrible things they said. You know, so they weren't the media wasn't too nice back then either. But I don't know. They did a some people say they didn't do much of an investigation, but it looks like they did. Seem I think they investigated fairly heavily, and this came up with they couldn't figure it out. They just couldn't come up with. They couldn't find, I don't know what the car, maybe they found, but they're not sure. Um, the, the sightings of the woman were questionable. She was, her body was never found. She was never found. Uh, there, the blood in the kitchen was O blood, which was her blood. But, uh, you know, even if the guy cut himself, his chances of being O blood are good too. They never found a match to the fingerprints. So, and the uh, palm print. What are they going to do? So, you know, especially if it's a stranger homicide. And this is where... People don't understand how difficult stranger homicides are. You know, it's really nice if you can find out that the husband hired a hit person. You know, that works. Um, or if uh, she's been stalked by a guy from work and it turns out to be him. That's nice. Or she just broke up with her boyfriend and her boyfriend killed her. You know, these are things at least you have a suspect. But when you don't have a suspect, you're looking at an entire area of all kinds of possibilities. So many people out there that could have committed the crime. Maybe 50, it's most likely male, so at least 50% of the population. Um, I think Pat needs a stiff drink for the comments. Mm, soda. <laughs> I haven't seen all the comments. Are they horrible? <laughs> you don't realize how many the comments come through here. They're like a couple hundred, and I can't even see them. Um, uh, oh. I know you're a big fan of Occam's razor. Yes, and 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 one should be, um, because most of the time Occam's razor is correct. You know, this the most likely, the simplest thing is usually true. Uh, there are occasions when it's not. That's why you have to always keep the open mind and don't have tunnel vision. I, I you know I totally believe in keeping the open mind. So if I were working the case, I would be I would be I would be looking for my profile. <laughs> If I were working the case, I'd be looking for a serial rapist, serial killer, um, stalker, obsessed stalker, uh, somebody, a stranger, near stranger type person. That's who I'd be looking for. But I would check out other stuff, too. I would check out you know, the author's story about the, the family. OK, I, you know, I check it out. They did check it out. They checked out to see who had alibis and they checked out their fingerprints of the family and they should. The abortionist thing, I don't know. Um, the abortion thing, I don't know how heavily that was checked out. Um, but, I mean, they looked for her in many places. I, I mean, if, if you believe abortion was possible, they would obviously want to see if there were any abortionists in the area, uh, legal abortionists or suspected illegal abortionists who might have been around. Um, they would check also with hospitals. They check, they check a bunch of stuff. But, you know, that would be pretty unlikely. But, you know, they, checking it doesn't hurt. Uh, you know, it doesn't hurt, um, but not everything, by the way, because people, especially families of uh, missing and murdered people, will say you you shouldn't let one tip go. And yes, you should, because you get a thousand tips and 90, 999 of them are junk. You're lucky if you have one that's worth anything. You cannot put out the manpower and the, the amount of hours and the, the amount of cost it is to chase down every silly tip. And they said they got them on this one, too. You know, the husband, the wife who hates her husband, the, what, the girlfriend who hates her boyfriend. There were lots of tips coming in about people, the people, you know, tips about people they didn't like. <laughs> um, let's see. Um, 
Yikes, the phone cord makes a grim scene. I think you're trying to say, well, yes, Frida. Um, strangling is a very common methodology. Uh, as Phone cords have been used a lot. I mean, that's, that's real popular uh, because they're pretty strong. Um, and instead of having to put your hands directly on you, this is very useful. So I, I you know, I, and here's something that um, killers do. They go with the flow, you know, let's say she, you know, the, he, she went for the phone and he just ripped, rips it out of her hand, you know, and there he's like, oh, <laughs> cool. <laughs> you know, Got a cord, you know, it's like, thanks. Thanks for giving me a weapon, you know. I haven't thought of that before, but hey, it'll work, you know. Um, wouldn't, it, wouldn't it make sense that she were still alive if he took her? Yes. I Yes. Uh, I, I would lean toward that because taking her away means that you get to have more fun with her. Um, however, taking her away or or, or taking a body away is still more is still risky in the sense you're carrying somebody in a, in a vehicle. Um, you could, the vehicle could be stopped by the police. Uh, you can leave evidence in a vehicle. You have to get rid of the body, regardless of whether it's already already deceased or whether you're going to make it deceased. Regardless, you it's 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 a lot more work to remove the person than to just leave them on the floor. Um, but that person did it regardless. That's the whole point. Um, Again, just because we say, well, I don't know why they did it. Well, they did do it. <laughs> you know. Um, now, kidnapping her without leaving all blood around is a much more sensible thing. In other words, if you could just come in and put a gun up and say, don't move and guide her out of the house and get into the car and drive away, that's better because there's no crime scene, right? She just disappears. That would be awesome. Then there would truly be a question of whether she ran off. Because there, you know, there were this was a crime scene. Otherwise, it wouldn't have been one. But this was an obvious crime scene. So, it, whatever happened here was, I, I have to say, because it seems sloppy as heck, was out of control, and the person wasn't all that good at what they did. All right, and so at the point where she either was injured and he still wanted to take her away or whether he made her dead and he thought i i, I don't I, I don't want them to find the body because they'll, then they'll know it's a, a sexual homicide and a murder i'll just take the body away and they'll be they'll be confused which turned out to be true actually see how well that worked you know <laughs> i'm sure the guy didn't figure it that way let's say she really was killed people are still talking about miscarriage abortion and running away so, because her body wasn't found there. So, yeah, maybe he just decided it would be better if I took the body away and um, then they won't have a murder. They won't have, they can't claim she's been murdered. And that has happened in quite a few cases. How do you, how do you say somebody's dead when you don't have proof that they're dead? Uh, there was not enough blood in this, in, in the crime scene to say she's dead. Now, if you have a massive amount of blood in the crime scene. You can pretty much show it, you know, that the person is dead, but there was not that much here. So that claim can't be made. So either she was attacked and strangled. And that's why there wasn't so much blood because it was only in the attack. Maybe they say bloody nose or, or whatever uh, that caused some bleeding, but then he strangled her and that was the end of the bleeding thing. Or he, he removed her from the house before she bled anymore or before he damaged her any further. We will never know. We just, there's no way to absolutely know that. Um, yeah, that would be true. Hide the evidence, so to speak, yes. If he took her away, two things disappear. A murder, a proof of murder, and a proof of sexual assault. So there is a reason to remove the body, although most don't bother. Um, She could have shut herself away with long phone cord, long cords. You know, I don't remember how long the cords were back then. I mean, I know that over time, phone cords became really long, like ridiculously long. I could take them to the next room, but I don't know how mo how most of them were back back in the '60s. I'm I'm trying to remember what they were like, but I don't remember my mother walking into another room on the phone. I remember I remember having to stand there next to the phone to talk to anybody. So. That's just me. Um, cool. 
Could she have been trying to hide under the table with the phone? Hmm. Well, maybe it's possible. You know, it's one of, again, one of those interesting things. It's possible. Um, and that could be what, that, that could be why if she was, if she tried to grab the phone and just called the operator and say, help, I need help. Um, and then he grabs her, you know, when you, when you, when you, when you stand up or pulled up that, that, that table might fly much further than you would expect. Maybe. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's all those things are like possibilities. Um, well, well, you we won't know. So we have to stay, stay with, um, reasonable, reasonable things that can happen. I thought, Sarah, your concept is very reasonable. She could have gone out to the mailbox with a coat on. Could be why she was wearing it as opposed to she put it on to leave. Um, it's possible the guy grabbed the coat to put it over the body so he could carry the body out of the house and he didn't, he wanted to keep his trunk clean or the back seat clean. You, know, could, you never know. This, this is, these are things you can't, getting into the head of the killer, you can only do to an extent, um, but you can't do it to the level of, oh, I know that's why he did that. Yeah, we don't know. Um, uh, let's see what else you have to say here. Um, <laughs> has attachment issues. <laughs> oh, yes, I do. <laughs> uh, that, that's that's the usual sign of a psychopath, right? <laughs> oh my goodness. Oh, the dry cleaner. Oh, that's a good question, Jill. Um, the dry cleaner did come over. Uh, he said that her door was not locked, but he knocked, and because she never locked it, he knocked, and she came and gave him the clothing, and um, he left. Uh, and did other errands. So, so I assume that there is proof that he, when he was there and he did other errands afterwards. So supposedly it was not around at the time that she had went missing. However, I have never seen anything really talked about because I don't know when the guy finished his work day. I don't know what kind of, what kind of car he might've had stuffed up in a garage someplace. He could have said, yeah, I really liked her when I came to do the drive cleaning. So I'm going to go back. It's possible. So I don't know who the police actually proved with solid alibis that they couldn't have committed the crime. And when I say solid again, solid alibis is an alibi that is not questionable in any way. In other words, mommy is never an alibi. Wifey's never an alibi. Girlfriend is never an alibi. Um, even this guy, Foster, who's um, his boss gave him this alibi. It, it, it was a little sketchy. Uh, by the time the boss, but mind you, he wasn't a, a right away suspect. It became one. And then the boss had to remember back to a certain day and how well he remembered it. Or he's just trying to, you know, he likes a guy and he thinks, oh, God, I'm not sure I'll say, you know, you were with me, you know, we're having lunch. Um, I don't know how solid an alibi it is. Now, if, now if four people went to lunch together, it would probably be a little bit better. Um, uh, if you have it, you know, anybody took video photo, well, that says most people didn't do video photos. Um, there was a, or if you were a waitress and you came into the restaurant and she, you know, you came in at the restaurant reopened at one o'clock or something, you know, and, uh, and you, you rolled in at that time, you know, something that really stands out and that you don't have a vested interest in giving that person an alibi. So alibis have to be solid. Um, and, and that is true. Um, easy to get away uh, with crime in those days, and it's harder now. That is true. We have the things that are really improved things is we have DNA. Uh, we have very good testing of blood and, and fingerprints and those kinds of things. But the best thing has been phones and um, and CCTV, phones and video. Uh, that has done a tremendous amount for catching people. Really, really good stuff. Let's see. Um, uh, well, let's see. Uh, oh, is it sure it was she who was seen? No, there was no proof that she was seen by anybody. So this is this is a problem. Um, take a certain area of town. Um, what do women look like in that area? In that area of Massachusetts, what do most women look like? 
<laughs> this is all this has always been a, a weird issue about things. It's like if if a lot of the women look the same, then they look the same. You know, I mean, I can't tell half the time I can't tell people apart. Uh, but, you know, you get 10 blonde women in an area. They all look the same. You have 10 brunettes. You have 10 black women. You have 10 Indian women, whatever it is. You know, you see somebody going down. You go down the highway and you say, OK, there's a woman there with brown hair. OK, big deal. She's an average height and she has brown hair. And, <laughs> you know, unless there's something extraordinarily unique, like she weighed 500 pounds, that might be unique. She she was six foot five. She had a red mohawk. That'd be good. She was missing a leg, something, something really major, um, something very, very unique. Then you could say, wow, they probably saw that person. But when you just have a very vague description, uh, and, uh, it just, you know, it's pro I, I'm going to guess it was a, probably a homeless woman or a drunk that they saw. I don't know what the other one is. And I don't know. I, I, I'm not around those highways or locations to see how many people walk in those areas. You know, in other words, if it's at the time of day when people are walking like walking to school to pick up their kid or they're walking to the store to buy something or whatever. I mean, is it possible that 10, 20 different people walk down that street? And at that one moment in time, somebody came by and saw a woman with brown hair and said, Oh, that must be, you know, I remember seeing her. And what is, what is the blood on her legs? Do they really see blood on her legs? And that's another question. Did they really, or did they see some mud on her legs? So they say, was she a homeless person? Was she a drunk? One of them disheveled, disheveled and acting strangely could be a, somebody who's like, you know, homeless drunk lady. I mean, you know, the fact that she'd be wandering around on the side of the highway makes very little sense. I mean, I have I, I can't I can't figure that part out why she would be doing that. And if she escaped from somebody's car or dumped out, she should have been found. I mean, there's no reason why she shouldn't have been found. And if we say, oh, she lost her me memory, she's got amnesia. How far is she going to get walking? She'd have to pull in someplace, and then they would say, who are you? And she'd say, I don't know. And they call the police. You know, especially she's wearing a nice coat, a coat that is a decent coat. And, you know, like, like she's a well-dressed lady. So I, I can't come up with any reason why she would have sudden amnesia rolling around out there. And the only other thing would be somebody dumped her out of the car, or she jumped out, and then they, they caught her or somebody else caught her and did away with her. But see, then you get into very extended... Um, very unlikely scenarios. <laughs> so um, let's see. Um, Lincoln is a very small town. Would a complete stranger have drawn attention? Apparently there was a, like a huge, I don't know, was, there, was it a military base or some other thing? There's like, like a lot of stuff there. It wasn't that small a town. I had a lot of, uh, even in 60s. I mean, the description he gave, um, uh, I don't know if I can go back that far on here. Um, like where they were let's see if i can go back a little bit um i'm just see if I, he had a whole thing about the town if you run a lot want to learn about the town um let me see if i can to understand what happened the houses let's see um i'm trying to see what's in the area um i don't know if i can find it but there was there was a lot of stuff there it was not there was there was there was enough people around the area where yeah, you, you could have strangers coming through, um, driving through. Uh, yeah. Would they be any, the question would be, uh, drawn attention. Well, maybe for a second, but I mean, when you see a stranger, unless you're in a town that has only a hundred people and then, you know, here comes the stranger, you know, who are you stranger? Unless it's, you know what I mean? I mean, it's, it's not that so small that I, you see somebody walking through town. You don't think it's somebody's friend. You don't stop them and say, what are you doing here? You know, they walk through town and that's that. You think they're there to deliver something. You think that they're working nearby. That's a relative. Yeah, you might notice them, but how how well do you notice them? How much time do you spend thinking about it? Um, oh, yes. And digital footprints. Oh, the computer stuff, too. That's very, very useful. Um, no, you don't get a period after you're pregnant. Well, not unless you have a tubal pregnancy. Then you do. Uh, but that's true. If you're just pregnant, pregnant, you wouldn't have a period. Yeah, that's true. But it doesn't mean you don't have in your house uh, uh, san sanitary napkins back in the day. Uh, sanitary napkins for when you did have a period. You'd have a, probably a box in there someplace. You could use in case that you suddenly miscarried. Uh, you could use a towel. I mean, just roll up a towel and 
use that, use a baby diaper, you know, whatever. But if you're bleeding, I'm pretty sure, you know, women don't like to bleed on their, uh, on their floors and rugs, you know, that's something that, uh, uh, on their bed and they don't want blood every place. So if you, if you start bleeding, pretty much you race straight into the bathroom and you, you, you do something to staunch the bleeding. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can't stop the bleeding, but you can at least keep it from gushing down your legs. So, you know, but um, let's say um, let's see. Oh, really? Is that true? Jerry Brudos killed an encyclopedia saleswoman. Eh, that can be. <laughs> I have a block against that. I do. You know, <laughs> you always have a block against like, like six to eight words or something. And um, usually you're just, you know, talking to your friends and they don't care. But, you know, when you're doing YouTube shows, you really should <laughs> be able to say the words. <laughs> um, Anne says, thanks to you all. I'm a lot better now. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry. I'm not going to put that out there. I did. Sorry. I thought you were talking about you were heading out. Never say anything on this channel. You don't want accidentally put on the screen. Just, just warning you guys, because it's, it's hard for me to see the entire statement before I hit the button there. Um, so at any rate, <laughs> um, sometimes it's good to stay, stay with the topic. Anyway, that's, that's going to be it. Um, I hope that was interesting to you about how, how to look at different scenarios and be rational about them and not get carried away with just about any fantastical possibility uh, because that's not profiling and that's not detective work. It's good for writing fiction. And that's why fiction can do that because fiction can write anything they want, even if it's ludicrous. I mean, I've watched how many, how many movies have I watched? I think this is the stupidest thing I've ever seen. And it's, and it becomes a super popular movie like a, Silence of the Lambs, I think, is one of the dumbest things I've ever seen. But made a fortune, <laughs> you know, so people don't have a problem with it. You know, and I'm going, this is just ridiculous. And, you know, fiction can be ridiculous. But as a profiler, if I'm going to instruct in profiling and logical thinking, you've got to stay away from those kind of things. So um, <laughs> anyway, um, Thank you for being here, everybody who's in the chat room. And if you, again, if you're new to the channel, please do like and subscribe and join Patreon below. If you haven't already, uh, that supports the channel. And um, I will see the rest of you probably on Wednesday at three o'clock for the hangout this week. Send along any requests that you have for that. And let's see if I can do the, let's see if I can do the end of my show better than I did the beginning of my show. <laughs> let's see if I hit the wrong button again. <laughs> Uh, it's very touchy. Things are very touchy on here. I don't think I've blown the introduction ever, but well, it's the first time. So let me try the end. Ready? Get set. Bye.